Eight things this book will help you achieve. 1. Get out of a mental rut. Think new thoughts. Acquire new visions. Discover new ambitions. 2. Make friends quickly and easily. 3. Increase your popularity. 4. Win people to your way of thinking. 5. Increase your influence, your prestige, your ability to get things done. 6. Handle complaints, avoid arguments, keep your human contacts smooth and pleasant. 7. Become a better speaker, a more entertaining conversationalist. 8. Arouse enthusiasm among your associates. This book has done all these things for more than 10 million readers in 36 languages. Preface to Revised Edition. How to Win Friends and Influence People was first published in 1937 in an edition of only 5,000 copies. Neither Dale Carnegie nor the publishers, Simon and Schuster, anticipated more than this modest sale. To their amazement, the book became an overnight sensation, and edition after edition rolled off the presses to keep up with the increasing public demand. Now to Win Friends and Influence People took its place in publishing history as one of the all-time international bestsellers. It touched a nerve and filled a human need that was more than a faddish phenomenon of post-depression days, as evidenced by its continued and uninterrupted sales into the 80s, almost half a century later. Dale Carnegie used to say that it was easier to make a million dollars than to put a phrase into the English language. How to win friends and influence people became such a phrase, quoted, paraphrased, parodied, used in innumerable contexts from political cartoon to novels. The book itself was translated into almost every known written language. Each generation has discovered it anew and has found it relevant. Which brings us to the logical question, why revise a book that has proven and continues to prove its vigorous and universal appeal? Why tamper with success? To answer that, we must realize that Dale Carnegie himself was a tireless reviser of his own work during his lifetime. How to Win Friends and Influence People was written to be used as a textbook for his courses in effective speaking and human relations and is still used in those courses today. Until his death in 1955 he constantly improved and revised the course itself to make it applicable to the evolving needs of an every growing public. No one was more sensitive to the changing currents of present-day life than Dale Carnegie. He constantly improved and refined his methods of teaching. He updated his book on effective speaking several times. Had he lived longer, he himself would have revised how to win friends and influence people to better reflect the changes that have taken place in the world since the 30s. Many of the names of prominent people in the book, well known at the time of first publication, are no longer recognized by many of today's readers. Certain examples and phrases seem as quaint and dated in our social climate as those in a Victorian novel. The important message and overall impact of the book is weakened to that extent. Our purpose, therefore, in this revision, is to clarify and strengthen the book for a modern reader without tampering with the content. We have not changed how to win friends and influence people except to make a few excisions and add a few more contemporary examples. The brash, breezy Carnegie style is intact even the 30s slang is still there. Dale Carnegie wrote as he spoke, in an intensively exuberant, colloquial conversational manner. So his voice still speaks as forcefully as ever, in the book and in his work. Thousands of people all over the world are being trained in Carnegie courses in increasing numbers each year. And other thousands are reading and studying how to win friends and influence people, and being inspired to use its principles to better their lives. To all of them, we offer this revision in the spirit of the honing and polishing of a finely made tool. Dorothy Carnegie, Mrs. Dale Carnegie. How this book was written, and why. During the first 35 years of the 20th century, the publishing houses of America printed more than a fifth of a million different books. Most of them were deadly dull, and many were financial failures. Many, did I say? The president of one of the largest publishing houses in the world confessed to me that his company, after 75 years of publishing experience, still lost money on seven out of every eight books it published. Why, then, did I have the temerity to write another book? And, after I had written it, why should you bother to read it? Fair questions, both, and I'll try to answer them. 
I have, since 1912, been conducting educational courses for business and professional men and women in New York. At first, I conducted courses in public speaking only courses designed to train adults, by actual experience, to think on their feet and express their ideas with more clarity, more effectiveness and more poise, both in business interviews and before groups. But gradually, as the seasons passed, I realized that as sorely as these adults needed training in effective speaking, they needed still more training in the fine art of getting along with people in everyday business and social contacts. I also gradually realized that I was sorely in need of such training myself. As I look back across the years, I am appalled at my own frequent lack of finesse and understanding. How I wish a book such as this had been placed in my hands 20 years ago. What a priceless boon it would have been. Dealing with people is probably the biggest problem you face especially if you are in business. Yes, and that is also true, if you are a housewife, architect or engineer. Research done a few years ago under the auspices of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching uncovered a most important and significant fact a fact later confirmed by additional studies made at the Carnegie Institute of Technology. These investigations revealed that even in such technical lines as engineering, about 15% of one's financial success is due to one's technical knowledge, and about 85% is due to skill in human engineering to personality and the ability to lead people. For many years, I conducted courses each season at the Engineers Club of Philadelphia and also courses for the New York chapter of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. A total of probably more than 1,500 engineers have passed through my classes. They came to me because they had finally realized, after years of observation and experience, that the highest paid personnel in engineering are frequently not those who know the most about engineering. One can, for example, hire mere technical ability in engineering, accountancy, architecture or any other profession at nominal salaries. But the person who has technical knowledge plus the ability to express ideas, to assume leadership, and to arouse enthusiasm among people, that person is headed for higher earning power. In the heyday of his activity, John D. Rockefeller said that the ability to deal with people is as purchasable a commodity as sugar or coffee. And I will pay more for that ability, said John D., than for any other under the sun. Wouldn't you suppose that every college in the land would conduct courses to develop the highest priced ability under the sun? But if there is just one practical common sense course of that kind given for adults in even one college in the land, it has escaped my attention up to the present writing. The University of Chicago and the United YMCA schools conducted a survey to determine what adults want to study. That survey cost 25000 and took two years. The last part of the survey was made in Meriden, Connecticut. It had been chosen as a typical American town. Every adult in Meriden was interviewed and requested to answer 156 questions questions such as what is your business or profession? Your education? How do you spend your spare time? What is your income? Your hobbies? Your ambitions? Your problems? What subjects are you most interested in studying? And so on. That survey revealed that health is the prime interest of adults and that their second interest is people how to understand and get along with people, how to make people like you, and how to win others to your way of thinking. So the committee conducting the survey resolved to conduct such a course for adults in Meriden. They searched diligently for a practical textbook on the subject and found not one. Finally they approached one of the world's outstanding authorities on adult education and asked him if he knew of any book that met the needs of this group. No, he replied. I know what those adults want. But the book they need has never been written. I knew from experience that this statement was true, for I myself have been searching for years to discover a practical, working handbook on human relations. Since no such book existed, I have tried to write one for use in my own courses. And here it is. I hope you like it. In preparation for this book, I read everything that I could find on the subject everything from newspaper columns, magazine articles, records of the family courts, the writings of the old philosophers and the new psychologists. In addition, I hired a trained researcher 
to spend one and a half years in various libraries reading everything I had missed, plowing through erudite tomes on psychology, poring over hundreds of magazine articles, searching through countless biographies, trying to ascertain how the great leaders of all ages had dealt with people. We read their biographies, we read the life stories of all great leaders from Julius Caesar to Thomas Edison. I recall that we read over 100 biographies of Theodore Roosevelt alone. We were determined to spare no time, no expense, to discover every practical idea that anyone had ever used throughout the ages for winning friends and influencing people. I personally interviewed scores of successful people, some of them world-famous inventors like Marconi and Edison, political leaders like Franklin D. Roosevelt and James Farley, business leaders like Owen D. Young, movie stars like Clark Gable and Mary Pickford, and explorers like Martin Johnson and tried to discover the techniques they used in human relations. From all this material, I prepared a short talk. I called it How to Win Friends and Influence People. I say short. It was short in the beginning, but it soon expanded to a lecture that consumed one hour and 30 minutes. For years, I gave this talk each season to the adults in the Carnegie Institute courses in New York. I gave the talk and urged the listeners to go out and test it in their business and social contacts and then come back to class and speak about their experiences and the results they had achieved. What an interesting assignment. These men and women, hungry for self-improvement, were fascinated by the idea of working in a new kind of laboratory the first and only laboratory of human relationships for adults that had ever existed. This book wasn't written in the usual sense of the word. It grew as a child grows. It grew and developed out of that laboratory, out of the experiences of thousands of adults. Years ago, we started with a set of rules printed on a card no larger than a postcard. The next season we printed a larger card, then a leaflet, then a series of booklets, each. One expanding in size and scope. After 15 years of experiment and research came this book. The rules we have set down here are not mere theories or guesswork. They work like magic. Incredible as it sounds, I have seen the application of these principles literally revolutionize the lives of many people. To illustrate, a man with 314 employees joined one of these courses. For years, he had driven and criticized and condemned his employees without stint or discretion. Kindness, words of appreciation and encouragement were alien to his lips. After studying the principles discussed in this book, this employer sharply altered his philosophy of life. His organization is now inspired with a new loyalty, a new enthusiasm, a new spirit of teamwork. 314 enemies have been turned into 314 friends. As he proudly said in a speech before the class, when I used to walk through my establishment, no one greeted me. My employees actually looked the other way when they saw me approaching. But now they are all my friends, and even the janitor calls me by my first name. This employer gained more profit, more leisure and what is infinitely more important he found far more happiness in his business and in his home. Countless numbers of salespeople have sharply increased their sales by the use of these principles. Many have opened up new accounts accounts that they had formerly solicited in vain. Executives have been given increased authority, increased pay. One executive reported a large increase in salary because he applied these truths. Another, an executive in the Philadelphia Gas Works Company, was slated for demotion when he was 65 because of his belligerence, because of his inability to lead people skillfully. This training not only saved him from the demotion, but brought him a promotion with increased pay. On innumerable occasions, spouses attending the banquet given at the end of the course have told me that their homes have been much happier since their husbands or wives started this training. People are frequently astonished at the new results they achieve. It all seems like magic. In some cases, in their enthusiasm, they have telephoned me at my home on Sundays because they couldn't wait 48 hours to report their achievements at the regular session of the course. One man was so stirred by a talk on these principles that he sat far into the night discussing them with other members of the class. At 3 o'clock in the morning, the others went home. But he was so shaken by a realization of his own mistakes, so inspired by the vista of a new and richer world opening before him, 
that he was unable to sleep. He didn't sleep that night or the next day or the next night. Who was he? A naive, untrained individual ready to gush over any new theory that came along? No, far from it. He was a sophisticated, blasé dealer in art, very much the man about town, who spoke three languages fluently and was a graduate of two European universities. While writing this chapter, I received a letter from a German of the old school, an aristocrat whose forebears had served for generations as professional army officers under the Hohenzollerns. His letter, written from a transatlantic steamer, telling about the application of these principles, rose almost to a religious fervor. Another man, an old New Yorker, a Harvard graduate, a wealthy man, the owner of a large carpet factory, declared he had learned more in 14 weeks through this system of training about the fine art of influencing people than he had learned about the same subject during his four years in college. Absurd? Laughable? Fantastic? Of course, you are privileged to dismiss this statement with whatever adjective you wish. I am merely reporting, without comment, a declaration made by a conservative, an eminently successful Harvard graduate in a public address to approximately 600 people at the Yale Club in New York on the evening of Thursday, February 23, 1933. Compared to what we ought to be, said the famous professor William James of Harvard, compared to what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use, those powers which you habitually fail to use. The sole purpose of this book is to help you discover, develop and profit by those dormant and unused assets, education, said Dr. John G. Hibben, former president of Princeton University, is the ability to meet life situations, if by the time you have finished reading the first three chapters of this book, if you aren't then a little better equipped to meet life situations, then I shall consider this book to be a total failure so far as you are concerned. For the great aim of education, said Herbert Spencer, is not knowledge but action. And this is an action book. Dale Carnegie 1936. Nine suggestions on how to get the most out of this book. 1. If you wish to get the most out of this book, there is one indispensable requirement one essential infinitely more important than any ruler technique. Unless you have this one fundamental requisite, a thousand rules on how to study will avail little, and if you do have this cardinal endowment, then you can achieve wonders without reading any suggestions for getting the most out of a book. What is this magic requirement? Just this, a deep, driving desire to learn, a vigorous determination to increase your ability to deal with people. How can you develop such an urge? by constantly reminding yourself how important these principles are to you. Picture to yourself how their mastery will aid you in leading a richer, fuller, happier and more fulfilling life. Say to yourself over and over, my popularity, my happiness and sense of worth depend to no small extent upon my skill in dealing with people. 2. Read each chapter rapidly at first to get a bird's eye view of it. You will probably be tempted then to rush on to the next one but don't unless you are reading merely for entertainment. But if you are reading because you want to increase your skill in human relations, then go back and reread each chapter thoroughly. In the long run, this will mean saving time and getting results. 3. Stop frequently in your reading to think over what you are reading. Ask yourself just how and when you can apply each suggestion. 4. Read with a crayon, pencil, pen, magic marker or highlighter in your hand. When you come across a suggestion that you feel you can use, draw a line beside it. If it is a four-star suggestion, then underscore every sentence or highlight it, or mark it with. Marking and underscoring a book makes it more interesting and far easier to review rapidly. 5. I knew a woman who had been office manager for a large insurance concern for 15 years. Every month, she read all the insurance contracts her company had issued that month. Yes, she read many of the same contracts over month after month, year after year. Why? Because experience had taught her that that was the only way she could keep their provisions clearly in mind. I once spent almost two years writing a book on public speaking, and yet I found I had to keep going back over it from time to time 
in order to remember what I had written in my own book. The rapidity with which we forget is astonishing. So, if you want to get a real, lasting benefit out of this book, don't imagine that skimming through it once will suffice. After reading it thoroughly, you ought to spend a few hours reviewing it every month, keep it on your desk in front of you every day. Glance through it often. Keep constantly impressing yourself with the rich possibilities for improvement that still lie in the offing. Remember that the use of these principles can be made habitual only by a constant and vigorous campaign of review and application. There is no other way. 6. Bernard Shaw once remarked, if you teach a man anything, he will never learn. Shaw was right. Learning is an active process. We learn by doing. So, if you desire to master the principles you are studying in this book, do something about them. Apply these rules at every opportunity. If you don't you will forget them quickly. Only knowledge that is used sticks in your mind. You will probably find it difficult to apply these suggestions all the time. I know because I wrote the book, and yet frequently I found it difficult to apply everything I advocated. For example, when you are displeased, it is much easier to criticize and condemn than it is to try to understand the other person's viewpoint. It is frequently easier to find fault than to find praise. It is more natural to talk about what you want than to talk about what the other person wants. And so on, so, as you read this book, remember that you are not merely trying to acquire information. You are attempting to form new habits. Ah yes, you are attempting a new way of life. That will require time and persistence and daily application. So refer to these pages often. Regard this as a working handbook on human relations. And whenever you are confronted with some specific problems such as handling a child, winning your spouse to your way of thinking, or satisfying an irritated customer hesitate about doing the natural thing, the impulsive thing. This is usually wrong. Instead, turn to these pages and review the paragraphs you have underscored. Then try these new ways, and watch them achieve magic for you. 7. Offer your spouse, your child or some business associate a dime, or a dollar every time he, or she catches you violating a certain principle. Make a lively game out of mastering these rules. 8. The president of an important Wall Street bank once described, in a talk before one of my classes, a highly efficient system he used for self-improvement. This man had little formal schooling, yet he had become one of the most important financiers in America, and he confessed that he owed most of his success to the constant application of his homemade system. This is what he does, I'll put it in his own words as accurately as I can remember. For years I have kept an engagement book showing all the appointments I had during the day. My family never made any plans for me on Saturday night, for the family knew that I devoted a part of each Saturday evening to the illuminating process of self-examination and review and appraisal. After dinner I went off by myself, opened my engagement book, and thought over all the interviews, discussions and meetings that had taken place during the week. I asked myself, what mistakes did I make that time? What did I do that was right, and in what way could I have improved my performance? What lessons can I learn from that experience? I often found that this weekly review made me very unhappy. I was frequently astonished at my own blunders. Of course, as the years passed, these blunders became less frequent. Sometimes I was inclined to pat myself on the back a little after one of these sessions. This system of self-analysis, self-education, continued year after year, did more for me than any other one thing I have ever attempted. It helped me improve my ability to make decisions, and it aided me enormously in all my contacts with people. I cannot recommend it too highly. Why not use a similar system to check up on your application of the principles discussed in this book? If you do, two things will result. First, you will find yourself engaged in an educational process that is both intriguing and priceless. Second, you will find that your ability to meet and deal with people will grow enormously. 9. You will find at the end of this book several blank pages on which you should record your triumphs in the application of these principles. Be specific. Give names, dates, results. Keeping such a record will inspire you to greater efforts. And how fascinating these entries will be when you chance upon them some evening years from now.
In order to get the most out of this book, A. Develop a deep, driving desire to master the principles of human relations, B. Read each chapter twice, before going on to the next one. C. As you read, stop frequently to ask yourself how you can apply each suggestion. D. Underscore each important idea. E. Review this book each month. F. Apply these principles at every opportunity. Use this volume as a working handbook to help you solve your daily problems. G. Make a lively game out of your learning by offering some friend a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating one of these principles. H. Check up each week on the progress you are making. Ask yourself what mistakes you have made, what improvement, what lessons you have learned for the future. I keep notes in the back of this book showing how and when you have applied these principles. A shortcut to distinction. This biographical information about Dale Carnegie was written as an introduction to the original edition of How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is reprinted in this edition to give the readers additional background on Dale Carnegie. It was a cold January night in 1935, but the weather couldn't keep them away. 2,500 men and women thronged into the Grand Ballroom of the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York. Every available seat was filled by half past seven. At eight o'clock, the eager crowd was still pouring in. The spacious balcony was soon jammed. Presently even standing space was at a premium, and hundreds of people, tired after navigating a day in business, stood up for an hour and a half that night to witness what? A fashion show? A six-day bicycle race or a personal appearance by Clark Gable? No. These people had been lured there by a newspaper ad. Two evenings previously, they had seen this full-page announcement in the New York Sun staring them in the face, learn to speak effectively prepare for leadership old stuff? Yes, but believe it or not, in the most sophisticated town on earth, during a depression with 20% of the population on relief, 2,500 people had left their homes and hustled to the hotel in response to that ad. The people who responded were of the upper economic strata executives, employers, and professionals. These men and women had come to hear the opening gun of an ultra-modern, ultra-practical course in effective speaking and influencing men in business a course given by the Dale Carnegie Institute of Effective Speaking and Human Relations. Why were they there, these 2,500 businessmen and women? Because of a sudden hunger for more education, because of the depression? Apparently not, for the same course who'd been playing to packed houses in New York City every season for the preceding 24 years. During that time, more than 15,000 business and professional people had been trained by Dale Carnegie. Even large skeptical conservative organizations such as the Westinghouse Electric Company, the McGraw-Hill Publishing Company, the Brooklyn Union Gas Company, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, and the New York Telephone Company have had this training conducted in their own offices for the benefit of their members and executives. The fact that these people, 10 or 20 years after leaving grade school, high school or college, come and take this training is a glaring commentary on the shocking deficiencies of our educational system. What do adults really want to study? That is an important question, and in order to answer it, the University of Chicago, the American Association for Adult Education, and the United YMCA schools made a survey over a two-year period. That survey revealed that the prime interest of adults is health. It also revealed that their second interest is in developing skill and human relationships they want to learn the technique of getting along with and influencing other people. They don't want to become public speakers, and they don't want to listen to a lot of high-sounding talk about psychology, they want suggestions they can use immediately in business, in social contacts, and in the home. So that was what adults wanted to study, was it? All right, said the people making the survey. Fine. If that is what they want, we'll give it to them. Looking around for a textbook, they discovered that no working manual had ever been written to help people solve their daily problems in human relationships. Here was a fine kettle of fish. For hundreds of years, learned volumes had been written on Greek and Latin and higher mathematics topics about which the average adult doesn't give two hoots. But on the one subject on which he has a thirst for knowledge, a veritable passion for guidance and help nothing. 
This explained the presence of 2,500 eager adults crowding into the grand ballroom of the Hotel Pennsylvania in response to a newspaper advertisement. Here, apparently, at last was the thing for which they had long been seeking. Back in high school and college, they had poured over books, believing that knowledge alone was the open sesame to financial and professional rewards. But a few years in the rough and tumble of business and professional life had brought sharp disillusionment. They had seen some of the most important business successes won by men who possessed, in addition to their knowledge, the ability to talk well, to win people to their way of thinking, and to sell themselves and their ideas. They soon discovered that, if one aspired to wear the captain's cap and navigate the ship of business, personality and the ability to talk are more important than a knowledge of Latin verbs or a sheepskin from Harvard. The advertisement in the New York Sun promised that the meeting would be highly entertaining. It was. Eighteen people who had taken the course were marshaled in front of the loudspeaker, and fifteen of them were given precisely 75 seconds each to tell his or her story. Only 75 seconds of talk, then bang went the gavel, and the chairman shouted, time. Next speaker. The affair moved with the speed of a herd of buffalo thundering across the plains. Spectators stood for an hour and a half to watch the performance. The speakers were a cross-section of life, several sales representatives, a chain store executive, a baker, the president of a trade association, two bankers, an insurance agent, an accountant, a dentist, an architect, a druggist who had come from Indianapolis to New York to take the course, a lawyer who had come from Havana, in order to prepare himself to give one important three-minute speech. The first speaker bore the Gaelic name Patrick J. O'Hare. Born in Ireland, he attended school for only four years, drifted to America, worked as a mechanic, then as a chauffeur. Now, however, he was 40, he had a growing family, and needed more money, so he tried selling trucks. Suffering from an inferiority complex that, as he put it, was eating his heart out, he had to walk up and down in front of an office half a dozen times before he could summon up enough courage to open the door. He was so discouraged as a salesman that he was thinking of going back to working with his hands in a machine shop when one day he received a letter inviting him to an organization meeting of the Dale Carnegie course in effective speaking. He didn't want to attend. He feared he would have to associate with a lot of college graduates, that he would be out of place. His despairing wife insisted that he go, saying, it may do you some good, Pat. God knows you need it. He went down to the place where the meeting was to be held and stood on the sidewalk for five minutes before he could generate enough self-confidence to enter the room. The first few times he tried to speak in front of the others, he was dizzy with fear. But as the weeks drifted by, he lost all fear of audiences and soon found that he loved to talk the bigger the crowd, the better. And he also lost his fear of individuals and of his superiors. He presented his ideas to them, and soon he had been advanced into the sales department. He had become a valued and much-liked member of his company. This night, in the Hotel Pennsylvania, Patrick O'Hare stood in front of 2,500 people and told a gay, rollicking story of his achievements. Wave after wave of laughter swept over the audience. Few professional speakers could have equaled his performance. The next speaker, Godfrey Meyer, was a gray-headed banker, the father of 11 children. The first time he had attempted to speak in class, he was literally struck dumb. His mind refused to function. His story is a vivid illustration of how leadership gravitates to the person who can talk. He worked on Wall Street, and for 25 years he had been living in Clifton, New Jersey. During that time, he had taken no active part in community affairs and knew perhaps 500 people. Shortly after he had enrolled in the Carnegie course, he received his tax bill and was infuriated by what he considered unjust charges. Ordinarily, he would have sat at home and fumed, or he would have taken it out in grousing to his neighbors. But instead, he put on his hat that night, walked into the town meeting, and blew off steam in public. As a result of that talk of indignation, the citizens of Clifton, New Jersey, urged him to run for the town council. So for weeks he went from one meeting to another, denouncing waste and municipal extravagance. There were 96 candidates in the field. 
When the ballots were counted, lo, Godfrey Meyer's name led all the rest. Almost overnight, he had become a public figure among the 40,000 people in his community. As a result of his talks, he made 80 times more friends in six weeks than he had been able to previously in 25 years. And his salary as councilman meant that he got a return of 1,000% a year on his investment in the Carnegie course. The third speaker, the head of a large national association of food manufacturers, told how he had been unable to stand up and express his ideas at meetings of the board of directors. As a result of learning to think on his feet, two astonishing things happened. He was soon made president of his association, and in that capacity, he was obliged to address meetings all over the United States. Excerpts from his talks were put on the Associated Press wires and printed in newspapers and trade magazines throughout the country. In two years, after learning to speak more effectively, he received more free publicity for his company and its products than he had been able to get previously with a quarter of a million dollars spent in direct advertising. This speaker admitted that he had formerly hesitated to telephone some of the more important business executives in Manhattan and invite them to lunch with him. But as a result of the prestige he had acquired by his talks, these same people telephoned him and invited him to lunch and apologized to him for encroaching on his time. The ability to speak is a shortcut to distinction. It puts a person in the limelight, raises one head and shoulders above the crowd. And the person who can speak acceptably is usually given credit for an ability out of all proportion to what he or she really possesses. A movement for adult education has been sweeping over the nation. And the most spectacular force in that movement was Dale Carnegie, a man who listened to and critiqued more talks by adults than has any other man in captivity. According to a cartoon by Believe It or Not Ripley, he had criticized 150,000 speeches. If that grand total doesn't impress you, remember that it meant one talk for almost every day that has passed since Columbus discovered America. Or, to put it in other words, if all the people who had spoken before him had used only three minutes and had appeared before him in succession, it would have taken 10 months, listening day and night, to hear them all. Dale Carnegie's own career, filled with sharp contrasts, was a striking example of what a person can accomplish when obsessed with an original idea and a fire with enthusiasm. Born on a Missouri farm 10 miles from a railway, he never saw a streetcar until he was 12 years old, yet by the time he was 46, he was familiar with the far-flung corners of the earth, everywhere from Hong Kong to Hammerfist, and, at one time, he approached closer to the North Pole than Admiral Byrd's headquarters at Little America was to the South Pole. This Missouri lad who had once picked strawberries and cut cockleburs for five cents an hour became the highly paid trainer of the executives of large corporations in the art of self-expression. This erstwhile cowboy who had once punched cattle and branded calves and ridden fences out in western South Dakota later went to London to put on shows under the patronage of the royal family. This chap who was a total failure the first half dozen times he tried to speak in public later became my personal manager. Much of my success has been due to training under Dale Carnegie. Young Carnegie had to struggle for an education, for hard luck was always battering away at the old farm in northwest Missouri with a flying tackle and a body slam. Year after year, the 102 River rose and drowned the corn and swept away the hay. Season after season, the fat hog sickened and died from cholera, the bottom fell out of the market for cattle and mules, and the bank threatened to foreclose the mortgage. Sick with discouragement, the family sold out and bought another farm near the State Teachers College at Warrensburg, Missouri. Board and room could be, head in town for a dollar a day, but young Carnegie couldn't afford it. So he stayed on the farm and commuted on horseback three miles to college each day. At home, he milked the cows, cut the wood, fed the hogs, and studied his Latin verbs by the light of a coal oil lamp until his eyes blurred, and he began to nod. Even when he got to bed at midnight, he set the alarm for three o'clock. His father bred pedigree Duroc Jersey hogs and there was danger, during the bitter cold nights, that the young pigs would freeze to death, so they were put in a basket, covered with a gunny sack, and set behind the kitchen stove. True to their nature, the pigs demanded a hot meal at 3 a.m., 
so when the alarm went off, Dale Carnegie crawled out of the blankets, took the basket of pigs out to their mother, waited for them to nurse, and then brought them back to the warmth of the kitchen stove. There were 600 students in State Teachers College, and Dale Carnegie was one of the isolated half-dozen who couldn't afford to board in town. He was ashamed of the poverty that made it necessary for him to ride back to the farm and milk the cows every night. He was ashamed of his coat, which was too tight, and his trousers, which were too short. Rapidly developing an inferiority complex, he looked about for some shortcut to distinction. He soon saw that there were certain groups in college that enjoyed influence and prestige the football and baseball players and the chaps who won the debating and public speaking contests. Realizing that he had no flair for athletics, he decided to win one of the speaking contests. He spent months preparing his talks. He practiced as he sat in the saddle galloping to college and back. He practiced his speeches as he milked the cows, and then he mounted a bale of hay in the barn, and with great gusto and gestures harangued the frightened pigeons about the issues of the day. But in spite of all his earnestness and preparation, he met with defeat after defeat. He was 18 at the time sensitive and proud. He became so discouraged, so depressed, that he even thought of suicide. And then suddenly he began to win, not one contest, but every speaking contest in college. Other students pleaded with him to train them, and they won also. After graduating from college, he started selling correspondence courses to the ranchers among the sand hills of western Nebraska and eastern Wyoming. In spite of all his boundless energy and enthusiasm, he couldn't make the grade. He became so discouraged that he went to his hotel room in Alliance, Nebraska, in the middle of the day, threw himself across the bed, and wept in despair. He longed to go back to college, he longed to retreat from the harsh battle of life, but he couldn't. So he resolved to go to Omaha and get another job. He didn't have the money for a railroad ticket, so he traveled on a freight train, feeding, and watering two carloads of wild horses in return for his passage, after landing in South Omaha, he got a job selling bacon and soap and lard for Armour and Company. His territory was up among the Badlands and the Calend Indian country of western South Dakota. He covered his territory by freight train and stagecoach and horseback and slept in pioneer hotels, where the only partition between the rooms was a sheet of muslin. He studied books on salesmanship, road bucking branches, played poker with the Indians, and learned how to collect money. And when, for example, an inland storekeeper couldn't pay cash for the bacon and hams he had ordered, Dale Carnegie would take a dozen pairs of shoes off his shelf, sell the shoes to the railroad men, and forward the receipts to Armour and Company. He would often ride a freight train a hundred miles a day. When the train stopped to unload freight, he would dash uptown, see three or four merchants, get his orders, and when the whistle blew, he would dash down the street again lickety-split and swing onto the train while it was moving. Within two years, he had taken an unproductive territory that had stood in the 25th place and had boosted it to first place among all the 29 car routes leading out of South Omaha. Armour and Company offered to promote him, saying, you have achieved what seemed impossible. But he refused the promotion and resigned, went to New York, studied at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and toured the country, playing the role of Dr. Hartley in Polly of the Circus. He would never be a Booth or a Barrymore. He had the good sense to recognize that, so back he went to sales work, selling automobiles and trucks for the Packard Motor Car Company. He knew nothing about machinery and cared nothing about it. Dreadfully unhappy, he had to scourge himself to his task each day. He longed to have time to study, to write the books he had dreamed about writing back in college. So he resigned. He was going to spend his days writing stories and novels and support himself by teaching in a night school. Teaching what? As he looked back and evaluated his college work, he saw that his training in public speaking had done more to give him confidence, courage, poison the ability to meet and deal with people in business than had all the rest of his college courses put together so he urged the YMCA schools in New York to give him a chance to conduct courses in public speaking for people in business. What? Make orators out of business people? Absurd. The YMCA people knew. 
They had tried such courses, and they had always failed. When they refused to pay him a salary of $2 a night, he agreed to teach on a commission basis and take a percentage of the net profits, if there were any profits to take. And inside of three years they were paying him $30 a night on that basis instead of two. The course grew. Other yes heard of it, then other cities. Dale Carnegie soon became a glorified circuit writer covering New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore and later London and Paris. All the textbooks were too academic and impractical for the business people who flocked to his courses. Because of this, he wrote his own book entitled Public Speaking and Influencing Men in Business. It became the official text of all the YMCAs as well as of the American Bankers Association and the National Credit Men's Association. Dale Carnegie claimed that all people can talk when they get mad. He said that, if you hit the most ignorant man in town on the jaw and knock him down, he would get on his feet and talk with an eloquence, heat and emphasis that would have rivaled that world-famous orator William Jennings Bryan at the height of his career. He claimed that almost any person can speak acceptably in public if he or she has self-confidence and an idea that is boiling and stewing within. The way to develop self-confidence, he said, is to do the thing you fear to do and get a record of successful experiences behind you. So he forced each class member to talk at every session of the course. The audience is sympathetic. They are all in the same boat. And, by constant practice, they develop a courage, confidence, and enthusiasm that carry over into their private speaking. Dale Carnegie would tell you that he made a living all these years, not by teaching public speaking that was incidental. His main job was to help people conquer their fears and develop courage. He started out at first to conduct merely a course in public speaking, but the students who came were businessmen and women. Many of them hadn't seen the inside of a classroom in 30 years. Most of them were paying their tuition on the installment plan. They wanted results, and they wanted them quick results that they could use the next day in business interviews and in speaking before groups. So he was forced to be swift and practical. Consequently, he developed a system of training that is unique a striking combination of public speaking, salesmanship, human relations and applied psychology. A slave to no hard and fast rules, he developed a course that is as real as the measles and twice as much fun. When the classes terminated, the graduates formed clubs of their own and continued to meet fortnightly for years afterward. One group of 19 in Philadelphia met twice a month during the winter season for 17 years. Class members frequently travel 50 or 100 miles to attend classes. One student used to commute each week from Chicago to New York. Professor William James of Harvard used to say that the average person develops only 10% of his latent mental ability. Dale Carnegie, by helping businessmen and women to develop their latent possibilities, created one of the most significant movements in adult education Lowell Thomas 1936. Part 1 Fundamental Techniques in Handling People 1. If you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. On May 7, 1931, the most sensational manhunt New York City had ever known, had come to its climax. After weeks of search, two gun Crowley the killer, the gunman who didn't smoke or drink was at bay, trapped in his sweetheart's apartment on West End Avenue. 150 policemen and detectives laid siege to his top-floor hideaway. They chopped holes in the roof. They tried to smoke out Crowley, the cop killer, with tear gas. Then they mounted their machine guns on surrounding buildings, and for more than an hour one of New York's fine residential areas reverberated with the crack of pistol fire and the rut-tat-tat of machine guns. Crowley, crouching behind an overstuffed chair, fired incessantly at the police. 10,000 excited people watched the battle. Nothing like it ever been seen before on the sidewalks of New York. When Crowley was captured, Police Commissioner E.P. Mulroney declared that the two-gun desperado was one of the most dangerous criminals ever encountered in the history of New York. He will kill, said the commissioner, at the drop of a feather. But how did two-gun Crowley regard himself? We know, because while the police were firing into his apartment, he wrote a letter addressed to whom it may concern, and, as he wrote, the blood flowing from his wounds left a crimson trail on the paper. In this letter Crowley said, under my coat, 
is a weary heart, but a kind one one, that would do nobody any harm. A short time before this, Crowley had been having a necking party with his girlfriend on a country road out on Long Island. Suddenly a policeman walked up to the car and said, let me see your license. Without saying a word, Crowley drew his gun and cut the policeman down with a shower of lead. As the dying officer fell, Crowley leaped out of the car, grabbed the officer's revolver, and fired another bullet into the prostrate body. And that was the killer who said, under my coat, is a weary heart, but a kind one one, that would do nobody any harm. Crowley was sentenced to the electric chair. When he arrived at the death house in Sing Sing, did he say, this is what I get for killing people? No, he said, this is what I get for defending myself. The point of the story is this, Two Gun Crowley didn't blame himself for anything. Is that an unusual attitude among criminals? If you think so, listen to this, I have spent the best years of my life giving people the lighter pleasures, helping them have a good time, and all I get is abuse, the existence of a hunted man. That's Al Capone speaking. Yes, America's most notorious public enemy the most sinister gang leader who ever shot up Chicago. Capone didn't condemn himself. He actually regarded himself as a public benefactor and unappreciated and misunderstood public benefactor. And so did Dutch Schultz, before he crumpled up under gangster bullets in Newark. Dutch Schultz, one of New York's most notorious rats, said in a newspaper interview that he was a public benefactor. And he believed it. I have had some interesting correspondence with Louis Laws, who was warden of New York's infamous Sing Sing prison for many years, on this subject, and he declared, the few of the criminals in Sing Sing regard themselves as bad men. They are just as human as you and I. So they rationalize, they explain. They can tell you, why they had to crack a safe, or be quick on the trigger finger. Most of them attempt by a form of reasoning, fallacious or logical, to justify their antisocial acts even to themselves, consequently stoutly maintaining that they should never have been imprisoned at all. If Al Capone, Two Gun Crowley, Dutch Schultz, and the desperate men and women behind prison walls don't blame themselves for anything, what about the people with whom you and I come in contact? John Wanamaker, founder of the stores that bear his name, once confessed, I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence. Wanamaker learned this lesson early, but I personally had to blunder through this old world for a third of a century before it even began to dawn upon me that 99 times out of 100, people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it may be. Criticism is futile, because it puts a person on the defensive, and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous, because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. B.F. Skinner, the world-famous psychologist, proved through his experiments that an animal rewarded for good behavior will learn much more rapidly and retain what it learns far more effectively than an animal punished for bad behavior. Later studies have shown that the same applies to humans. By criticizing, we do not make lasting changes and often incur resentment. Hans Eli, another great psychologist, said, as much as we thirst for approval, we dread condemnation, the resentment that criticism engenders can demoralize employees, family members and friends, and still not correct the situation that has been condemned. George B. Johnston of Enid, Oklahoma, is the safety coordinator for an engineering company, one of his responsibilities is to see that employees wear their hard hats whenever they are on the job in the field. He reported that whenever he came across workers who were not wearing hard hats, he would tell them with a lot of authority of the regulation and that they must comply. As a result he would get sullen acceptance, and often after he left, the workers would remove the hats. He decided to try a different approach. The next time he found some of the workers not wearing their hard hat, he asked if the hats were uncomfortable or did not fit properly. Then he reminded the men in a pleasant tone of voice that the hat was designed to protect them from injury and suggested that it always be worn on the job. The result was increased compliance with the regulation with no resentment or emotional upset. 
you will find examples of the futility of criticism bristling on a thousand pages of history, take, for example, the famous quarrel between Theodore Roosevelt and President Taft a quarrel that split the Republican Party, put Woodrow Wilson in the White House, and wrote bold, luminous lines across the First World War and altered the flow of history. Let's review the facts quickly. When Theodore Roosevelt stepped out of the White House in 1908, he supported Taft, who was elected president. Then Theodore Roosevelt went off to Africa to shoot lions. When he returned, he exploded. He denounced Taft for his conservatism, tried to secure the nomination for a third term himself, formed the Bull Moose Party, and all but demolished the GOP. In the election that followed, William Howard Taft and the Republican Party carried only two states Vermont and Utah. The most disastrous defeat the party had ever known. Theodore Roosevelt blamed Taft, but did President Taft blame himself? Of course not, with tears in his eyes, Taft said, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Who was to blame? Roosevelt or Taft? Frankly, I don't know, and I don't care. The point I am trying to make is that all of Theodore Roosevelt's criticism didn't persuade Taft that he was wrong. It merely made Taft strive to justify himself and to reiterate with tears in his eyes, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Or, take the Teapot Dome oil scandal. It kept the newspapers ringing with indignation in the early 1920s. It rocked the nation. Within the memory of living men, nothing like it had ever happened before in American public life. Here are the bare facts of the scandal, Albert B. Fall, Secretary of the Interior in Harding's cabinet, was entrusted with the leasing of government oil reserves at Elk Hill and Teapot Dome oil reserves that had been set aside for the future use of the Navy. Did Secretary Fall permit competitive bidding? No, sir. He handed the fat, juicy contract outright to his friend Edward L. Doheny. And what did Doheny do? He gave Secretary Fall what he was pleased to call a loan of $100,000. Then, in a high-handed manner, Secretary Fall ordered United States Marines into the district to drive off competitors whose adjacent wells were sapping oil out of the Elk Hill reserves. These competitors, driven off their ground at the ends of guns and bayonets, rushed into court and blew the lid off the Teapot Dome scandal. A stench arose so vile that it ruined the Harding administration, nauseated an entire nation, threatened to wreck the Republican Party, and put Albert B. Fall behind prison bars. Fall was condemned viciously condemned as few men in public life have ever been. Did he repent? Never. Years later Herbert Hoover intimated in a public speech that President Harding's death had been due to mental anxiety and worry because a friend had betrayed him. When Mrs. Fall heard that, she sprang from her chair, she wept, she shook her fists at fate and screamed, what? Harding betrayed by fall? No. My husband never betrayed anyone. This whole house full of gold would not tempt my husband to do wrong. He is the one who has been betrayed and led to the slaughter and crucified. There you are, human nature in action, wrongdoers, blaming everybody but themselves. We are all like that. So when you and I are tempted to criticize someone tomorrow, let's remember Al Capone, Two Gun Crowley and Albert Fall. Let's realize that criticisms are like homing pigeons. They always return home. Let's realize that the person we are going to correct and condemn will probably justify himself or herself and condemn us in return, or, like the gentle Taft, will say, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. On the morning of April 15, 1865, Abraham Lincoln lay dying in a hall bedroom of a cheap lodging house directly across the street from Ford's Theater, where John Wilkes Booth had shot him. Lincoln's long body lay stretched diagonally across a sagging bed that was too short for him. A cheap reproduction of Rosa Bonheur's famous painting The Horse Fair hung above the bed, and a dismal gas jet flickered yellow light. As Lincoln lay dying, Secretary of War Stanton said, there lies the most perfect ruler of men, that the world has ever seen. What was the secret of Lincoln's success in dealing with people? I studied the life of Abraham Lincoln for 10 years and devoted all of three years to writing and rewriting a book entitled Lincoln the Unknown. 
I believe I have made as detailed and exhaustive a study of Lincoln's personality and home life as it is possible for any being to make. I made a special study of Lincoln's method of dealing with people. Did he indulge in criticism? Oh, yes. As a young man in the Pigeon Creek Valley of Indiana, he not only criticized, but he wrote letters and poems ridiculing people and dropped these letters on the country roads where they were sure to be found. One of these letters aroused resentments that burned for a lifetime. Even after Lincoln had become a practicing lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, he attacked his opponents openly in letters published in the newspapers. But he did this just once too often. In the autumn of 1842 he ridiculed a vain, pugnacious politician by the name of James Shields. Lincoln lambasted him through an anonymous letter published in Springfield Journal. The town roared with laughter. Shields, sensitive and proud, boiled with indignation. He found out who wrote the letter, leaped on his horse, started after Lincoln, and challenged him to fight a duel. Lincoln didn't want to fight. He was opposed to dueling, but he couldn't get out of it and save his honor. He was given the choice of weapons. Since he had very long arms, he chose cavalry broadswords and took lessons in sword fighting from a West Point graduate. And, on the appointed day, he and Shields met on a sandbar in the Mississippi River, prepared to fight to the death. But, at the last minute, their seconds interrupted and stopped the duel. That was the most lurid personal incident in Lincoln's life. It taught him an invaluable lesson in the art of dealing with people. Never again did he write an insulting letter. Never again did he ridicule anyone. And from that time on, he almost never criticized anybody for anything. Time after time, during the Civil War, Lincoln put a new general at the head of the Army of the Potomac, and each one in turn McClellan, Pope, Burnside, Hooker, Meade blundered tragically and drove Lincoln to pacing the floor in despair. Half the nation savagely condemned these incompetent generals, but Lincoln, with malice toward none, with charity for all, held his peace. One of his favorite quotations was judge not, that ye be not judged. And when Mrs. Lincoln and others spoke harshly of the Southern people, Lincoln replied, don't criticize them, they are just what we would be under similar circumstances. Yet if any man ever had occasion to criticize, surely it was Lincoln. Let's take just one illustration. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought during the first three days of July 1863. During the night of July 4, Lee began to retreat southward, while storm clouds deluged the country with rain. When Lee reached the Potomac with his defeated army, he found a swollen impassable river in front of him and a victorious Union army behind him. Lee was in a trap. He couldn't escape. Lincoln saw that. Here was a golden, heaven-sent opportunity the opportunity to capture Lee's army and end the war immediately. So, with a surge of high hope, Lincoln ordered Meade not to call a council of war, but to attack Lee immediately. Lincoln telegraphed his orders and then sent a special messenger to Meade demanding immediate action. And what did General Meade do? He did the very opposite of what he was told to do. He called a council of war in direct violation of Lincoln's orders. He hesitated. He procrastinated. He telegraphed all manner of excuses. He refused point-blank to attack Lee. Finally the waters receded and Lee escaped over the Potomac with his forces. Lincoln was furious, what does this mean? Lincoln cried to his son Robert. Great God! What does this mean? We had them within our grasp and had only to stretch forth our hands and they were ours, yet nothing that I could say or do could make the army move. Under the circumstances, almost any general could have defeated Lee. If I had gone up there, I could have whipped him myself. In bitter disappointment, Lincoln sat down and wrote me this letter. And remember, at this period of his life Lincoln was extremely conservative and restrained in his phraseology. So this letter coming from Lincoln in 1863 was tantamount to the severest rebuke. My dear General, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river? when you can take with. 
you very few know more than two-thirds of the force you then had in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect, and I do not expect, that you can now affect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably because of it. What do you suppose Meade did, when he read the letter? Meade never saw that letter. Lincoln never mailed it. It was found among his papers after his death. My guess is, and this is only a guess, that after writing that letter, Lincoln looked out of the window and said to himself, just a minute. Maybe I ought not to be so hasty. It is easy enough for me to sit here in the quiet of the White House and order me to attack. But if I had been up at Gettysburg, and if I had seen as much blood as Meade has seen during the last week, and if my ears had been pierced with the screams and shrieks of the wounded and dying, maybe I wouldn't be so anxious to attack either. If I had Meade's timid temperament, perhaps I would have done just what he had done. Anyhow, it is water under the bridge now. If I send this letter, it will relieve my feelings, but it will make me try to justify himself. It will make him condemn me. It will arouse hard feelings, impair all his further usefulness as a commander, and perhaps force him to resign from the army. So, as I have already said, Lincoln put the letter aside, for he had learned by bitter experience, that sharp criticisms and rebukes almost invariably end in futility. Theodore Roosevelt said that when he, as president, was confronted with a perplexing problem, he used to lean back and look up at a large painting of Lincoln which hung above his desk in the White House and ask himself, what would Lincoln do, if you were in my shoes? How would he solve this problem? The next time we are tempted to admonish somebody, let's pull a $5 bill out of our pocket, look at Lincoln's picture on the bill, and ask, how would Lincoln handle this problem, if he had it? Mark Twain lost his temper occasionally, and wrote letters that turned the paper brown. For example, he once wrote to a man who had aroused his ire, the thing for you is a burial permit. You have only to speak, and I will see, that you get it. On another occasion he wrote to an editor about a proofreader's attempts to improve my spelling and punctuation. He ordered, set the matter according to my copy hereafter, and see that the proofreader retains his suggestions in the mush of his decayed brain. The writing of these stinging letters made Mark Twain feel better. They allowed him to blow off steam, and the letters didn't do any real harm, because Mark's wife secretly lifted them out of the mail. They were never sent. Do you know someone you would like to change and regulate and improve? Good. That is fine. I am all in favor of it, but why not begin on yourself? From a purely selfish standpoint, that is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others, yes, and a lot less dangerous. Don't complain about the snow on your neighbor's roof, said Confucius, when your own doorstep is unclean. When I was still young and trying hard to impress people, I wrote a foolish letter to Richard Harding Davis, an author who once loomed large on the literary horizon of America. I was preparing a magazine article about authors, and I asked Davis to tell me about his method of work. A few weeks earlier, I had received a letter from someone with this notation at the bottom, dictated but not read. I was quite impressed. I felt that the writer must be very big and busy and important. I wasn't the slightest bit busy, but I was eager to make an impression on Richard Harding Davis, so I ended my short note with the words, dictated but not read. He never troubled to answer the letter. He simply returned it to me with this scribbled across the bottom, your bad manners are exceeded only by your bad manners. True, I have blundered, and perhaps I deserved this rebuke. But, being human, I resented it. I resented it so sharply that, when I read of the death of Richard Harding Davis ten years later, the one thought that still persisted in my mind I am ashamed to admit, was the hurt he had given me. If you and I want to stir up a resentment tomorrow that may rankle across the decades and endure until death, just let us indulge in a little stinging criticism, no matter how certain we are that it is justified. When dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic. We are dealing with creatures of emotion, creatures bristling with prejudices and motivated by pride and vanity. Bitter criticism caused the sensitive Thomas Hardy, one of the finest novelists ever to enrich English literature, to give up forever the writing of fiction. Criticism drove Thomas Chatterton, the English poet, to suicide. Benjamin Franklin, tactless in his youth, became so diplomatic, so adroit at handling people, 
that he was made American ambassador to France. The secret of his success? I will speak ill of no man, he said, dot and speak all the good I know of everybody. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain and most fools do. But it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. A great man shows his greatness, said Carlyle, by the way he treats little men. Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot and frequent performer at air shows, was returning to his home in Los Angeles from an air show in San Diego. As described in the magazine Flight Operations, at 300 feet in the air, both engines suddenly stopped. By deft maneuvering he managed to land the plane, but it was badly damaged, although nobody was hurt. Hoover's first act after the emergency landing was to inspect the airplane's fuel. Just as he suspected, the World War II propeller plane he had been flying had been fueled with jet fuel rather than gasoline. Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the mechanic who had serviced his airplane. The young man was sick with the agony of his mistake. Tears streamed down his face as Hoover approached. He had just caused the loss of a very expensive plane, and could have caused the loss of three lives as well. You can imagine Hoover's anger. One could anticipate the tongue lashing that this proud and precise pilot would unleash for that carelessness. But Hoover didn't scold the mechanic, he didn't even criticize him. Instead, he put his big arm around the man's shoulder and said, to show you I'm sure that you'll never do this again, I want you to service my F-51 tomorrow. Often parents are tempted to criticize their children. You would expect me to say don't. But I will not, I am merely going to say, before you criticize them, read one of the classics of American journalism, Father Forgets. It originally appeared as an editorial in the People's Home Journal. We are reprinting it here with the author's permission, as condensed in the Reader's Digest, Father Forgets is one of those little pieces which dashed of in a moment of sincere feeling strikes an echoing chord in, so many readers, as to become a perennial reprint favorite. Since its first appearance, Father Forgets has been reproduced, writes the author, W. Livingston Larned, in hundreds of magazines and house organs, and in newspapers the country over. It has been reprinted almost as extensively in many foreign languages. I have given personal permission to thousands who wish to read it from school, church, and lecture platforms. It has been on the air on countless occasions and programs. Oddly enough, college periodicals have used it, and high school magazines. Sometimes a little piece seems mysteriously to click. This one certainly did. Father forgets W. Livingston Larn listen, son, I am saying this as you lie asleep, one little paw crumpled under your cheek, and the blonde curls stickily wet on your damp forehead. I have stolen into your room alone. Just a few minutes ago. As I sat reading my paper in the library, a stifling wave of remorse swept over me. Guiltily I came to your bedside. There are the things I was thinking, son, I had been cross to you. I scolded you as you were dressing for school, because you gave your face merely a dab with a towel. I took you to task for not cleaning your shoes. I called out angrily, when you threw some of your things on the floor. At breakfast I found fault too. You spilled things. You gulp down your food. You put your elbows on the table. You spread butter too thick on your bread. And as you started off to play, and I made for my train, you turned and waved a hand and called, goodbye, daddy, and I frowned, and said in reply, hold your shoulders back. Then it began all over again in the late afternoon. As I came up the road I spied you, down on your knees, playing marbles. There were holes in your stockings. I humiliated you before your boyfriends, by marching you ahead of me to the house. Stockings were expensive, and if you had to buy them, you would be more careful. Imagine that, son, from a father. Do you remember, later, when I was reading in the library, how you came in timidly, with a sort of hurt look in your eyes? When I glanced up over my paper, impatient at the interruption, you hesitated at the door. What is it you want? I snapped. You said nothing but ran across in one tempestuous plunge, and threw your arms around my neck and kissed me, and your small arms tightened with an affection, that God had set blooming in your heart, and which even neglect could not wither. And then you were gone, pattering up the stairs. Well, son, it was shortly afterwards, that my paper slipped from my hands, 
and a terrible sickening fear came over me. What has habit been doing to me? The habit of finding fault, of reprimanding this was my reward to you for being a boy. It was not that I did not love you. It was that I expected too much of youth. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years. And there was so much that was good and fine and true in your character. The little heart of you was as big as the dawn itself over the wide hills. This was shown by your spontaneous impulse to rush in and kiss me good night. Nothing else matters tonight, son. I have come to your bedside in the darkness, and I have knelt there, ashamed. It is a feeble atonement. I know you would not understand these things if I told them to you during your waking hours. But tomorrow I will be a real daddy. I will chum with you and suffer when you suffer and laugh when you laugh. I will bite my tongue when impatient words come. I will keep saying, as if it were a ritual, he is nothing but a boy a little boy. I am afraid I have visualized you as a man. Yet as I see you now, son, crumpled and weary in your cot, I see that you are still a baby. Yesterday you were in your mother's arms, your head on her shoulder. I have asked too much, too much. Instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. As Dr. Johnson said, God himself, sir, does not propose to judge man until the end of his days. Why should you and I? Principle 1 Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. 2. The big secret of dealing with people. There is only one way under high heaven to get anybody to do anything. Did you ever stop to think of that? Yes, just one way. And that is by making the other person want to do it. Remember, there is no other way. Of course, you can make someone want to give you his watch by sticking a revolver in his ribs. You can make your employees give you cooperation until your back is turned by threatening to fire them. You can make a child do what you want it to do by a whip or a threat. But these crude methods have sharply undesirable repercussions. The only way I can get you to do anything is by giving you what you want. What do you want? Sigmund Freud said that everything you and I do springs from two motives, the sex urge and the desire to be great. John Dewey one of America's most profound philosophers, phrased it a bit differently. Dr. Dewey said that the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. Remember that phrase, the desire to be important. It is significant. You are going to hear a lot about it in this book. What do you want? Not many things, but the few that you do wish, you crave with an insistence that will not be denied. Some of the things most people want include, one, health and the preservation of life. 2. Food. 3. Sleep. 4. Money and the things money will buy. 5. Life in the hereafter. 6. Sexual gratification. 7. The well-being of our children. 8. A feeling of importance. Almost all these wants are usually gratified all except one. But there is one longing almost as deep, almost as imperious, as the desire for food or sleep which is seldom gratified. It is what Freud calls the desire to be great. It is what Dewey calls the desire to be important. Lincoln once began a letter saying, everybody likes a compliment. William James said, the deepest principle in human. Nature is the craving to be appreciated. He didn't speak, mind you, of the wish or the desire, or the longing to be appreciated. He said the craving to be appreciated. Here is a gnawing and unfaltering human hunger, and the rare individual who honestly satisfies this heart hunger will hold people in the palm of his or her hand, and even the undertaker will be sorry when he dies. The desire for a feeling of importance is one of the chief distinguishing differences between mankind and the animals. To illustrate, when I was a farm boy out in Missouri, my father bred fine Duroc Jersey hogs and pedigreed white-faced cattle. We used to exhibit our hogs, and white-faced cattle at the country fairs and livestock shows throughout the Middle West. We won first prizes by the score. My father pinned his blue ribbons on a sheet of white muslin, and when friends or visitors came to the house, he would get out the long sheet of muslin. He would hold one end, and I would hold the other while he exhibited the blue ribbons. The hogs didn't care about the ribbons they had won. But father did. 
These prizes gave him a feeling of importance. If our ancestors hadn't had this flaming urge for a feeling of importance, civilization would have been impossible. Without it, we should have been just about like animals. It was this desire for a feeling of importance that led an uneducated, poverty-stricken grocery clerk to study some law books he found in the bottom of a barrel of household plunder that he had bought for 50 cents. You have probably heard of this grocery clerk. His name was Lincoln. It was this desire for a feeling of importance that inspired Dickens to write his immortal novels. This desire inspired Sir Christopher Wren to design his symphonies in stone. This desire made Rockefeller amass millions that he never spent. And this same desire made the richest family in your town build a house far too large for its requirements. This desire makes you want to wear the latest styles, drive the latest cars, and talk about your brilliant children. It is this desire that lures many boys and girls into joining gangs and engaging in criminal activities. The average young criminal, according to E.P. Mulroney, one-time police commissioner of New York, is filled with ego, and his first request after arrest is for those lurid newspapers that make him out a hero. The disagreeable prospect of serving time seems remote, so long as he can gloat over his likeness-sharing space with pictures of sports figures, movie and TV stars and politicians. If you tell me how you get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are. That determines your character. That is the most significant thing about you. For example, John D. Rockefeller got his feeling of importance by giving money to erect a modern hospital in Peking, China, to care for millions of poor people whom he had never seen and never would see. Dillinger, on the other hand, got his feeling of importance by being a bandit, a bank robber and killer. When the FBI agents were hunting him, he dashed into a farmhouse up in Minnesota and said, I'm Dillinger. He was proud of the fact that he was public enemy number one. I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm Dillinger, he said. Yes, the one significant difference between Dillinger and Rockefeller is how they got their feeling of importance. History sparkles with amusing examples of famous people struggling for a feeling of importance. Even George. Washington wanted to be called His Mightiness, the President of the United States. And Columbus pleaded for the title Admiral of the Ocean and Viceroy of India. Catherine the Great refused to open letters that were not addressed to Her Imperial Majesty. And Mrs. Lincoln, in the White House, turned upon Mrs. Grant like a tigress and shouted, How dare you be seated in my presence until I invite you? Our millionaires helped finance Admiral Byrd's expedition to the Antarctic in 1928 with the understanding that ranges of icy mountains would be named after them. And Victor Hugo aspired to have nothing less than the city of Paris renamed in his honor. Even Shakespeare, mightiest of the mighty, tried to add luster to his name by procuring a coat of arms for his family. People sometimes became invalids in order to win sympathy and attention and get a feeling of importance. For example, take Mrs. McKinley. She got a feeling of importance by forcing her husband, the President of the United States, to neglect important affairs of state, while he reclined on the bed beside her for hours at a time, his arm about her, soothing her to sleep. She fed her gnawing desire for attention by insisting that he remain with her while she was having her teeth fixed, and once created a stormy scene when he had to leave her alone with a dentist while he kept an appointment with John Hay, his Secretary of State. The writer Mary Roberts Reinhardt once told me of a bright, vigorous young woman who became an invalid in order to get a feeling of importance. One day, said Mrs. Reinhardt, this woman had been obliged to face something, her age perhaps. The lonely years were stretching ahead and there was little left for her to anticipate. She took to her bed and for 10 years her old mother traveled to the third floor and back, carrying trays, nursing her. Then one day the old mother, weary with service, lay down and died. For some weeks, the invalid languished, then she got up, put on her clothing, and resumed living again. Some authorities declare that people may actually go insane in order to find, in the dreamland of insanity, the feeling of importance that has been denied them in the harsh world of reality. There are more patients suffering from mental diseases in the United States than from all other diseases combined. What is the cause of insanity? Nobody can answer such a sweeping question, but we know that certain diseases, 
such as syphilis, break down and destroy the brain cells and result in insanity. In fact, about one half of all mental diseases can be attributed to such physical causes as brain lesions, alcohol, toxins and injuries. But the other half and this is the appalling part of the story the other half of the people who go insane apparently have nothing organically wrong with their brain cells. In post-mortem examinations, when their brain tissues are studied under the highest powered microscopes, these tissues are found to be apparently just as healthy as yours and mine. Why do these people go insane? I put that question to the head physician of one of our most important psychiatric hospitals. This doctor, who has received the highest honors and the most coveted awards for his knowledge of this subject, told me frankly that he didn't know why people went insane. Nobody knows for sure, but he did say that many people who go insane find in insanity a feeling of importance that they were unable to achieve in the world of reality. Then he told me this story, I have a patient right now whose marriage proved to be a tragedy. She wanted love, sexual gratification, children and social prestige, but life blasted all her hopes. Her husband didn't love her. He refused even to eat with her and forced her to serve his meals in his room upstairs. She had no children, no social standing. She went insane and, in her imagination, she divorced her husband and resumed her maiden name. She now believes she has married into English aristocracy and she insists on being called Lady Smith. And as for children, she imagines now that she has had a new child every night. Each time I call on her she says, Doctor, I had a baby last night. Life once wrecked all her dream ships on the sharp rocks of reality, but in the sunny, fantasy isles of insanity, all her barkentines race into port with canvas billowing and wind singing through the masts. Tragic? Oh, I don't know. Her physician said to me, if I could stretch out my hand and restore her sanity, I wouldn't do it. She's much happier as she is. If some people are so hungry for a feeling of importance that they actually go insane to get it, imagine what miracle you and I can achieve by giving people honest appreciation the side of insanity. One of the first people in American business to be paid a salary of over a million dollars a year when there was no income tax and a person earning $50 a week was considered well off was Charles Schwab. He had been picked by Andrew Carnegie to become the first president of the newly formed United States Steel Company in 1921 when Schwab was only 38 years old. Schwab later left U.S. Steel to take over the then troubled Bethlehem Steel Company and he rebuilt it into one of the most profitable companies in America. Why did Andrew Carnegie pay a million dollars a year, or more than three thousand dollars a day, to Charles Schwab? Why? Because Schwab was a genius? No. Because he knew more about the manufacture of steel than other people? Nonsense. Charles Schwab told me himself that he had many men working for him who knew more about the manufacture of steel than he did. Schwab says that he was paid this salary, largely because of his ability to deal with people. I ask him how he did it. Here is his secret set down in his own words words that ought to be cast in eternal bronze and hung in every home and school, every shop and office in the land words that children ought to memorize instead of wasting their time memorizing the conjugation of Latin verbs or the amount of the annual rainfall in Brazil words that will all but transform your life and mine if we will only live them. I consider my ability to arouse enthusiasm among my people, said Schwab, the greatest asset I possess, and the way to develop the best that is in a person is by appreciation and encouragement. There is nothing else that so kills the ambitions of a person as criticisms from superiors. I never criticize anyone. I believe in giving a person incentive to work. So I am anxious to praise, but loath to find fault. If I like anything, I am hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. That is what Schwab did. But what do average people do? The exact opposite. If they don't like a thing, they bowl out their subordinates. If they do like it, they say nothing. As the old couplet says, once I did bad, and that I heard. Ever twice I did good, but that I heard never. In my wide association in life, meeting with many and great people in various parts of the world, Schwab declared, I have yet to find the person, however great or exalted his station, who did not do better work 
and put forth greater effort under a spirit of approval than he would ever do under a spirit of criticism. That he said, frankly, was one of the outstanding reasons for the phenomenal success of Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie praised his associates publicly as well as privately. Carnegie wanted to praise his assistants even on his tombstone. He wrote an epitaph for himself which read, Here lies one who knew how to get around him men who were cleverer than himself. Sincere appreciation was one of the secrets of the first John D. Rockefeller's success in handling men. For example, when one of his partners, Edward T. Bedford, lost a million dollars for the firm by a bad buy in South America, John D. might have criticized. But he knew Bedford had done his best, and the incident was closed. So Rockefeller found something to praise. He congratulated Bedford because he had been able to save 60% of the money he had invested. That's splendid, said Rockefeller. We don't always do as well as that upstairs. I have among my clippings a story that I know never happened, but it illustrates a truth, so I'll repeat it. According to this silly story, a farm woman, at the end of a heavy day's work, set before her menfolks a heaping pile of hay. And when they indignantly demanded whether she had gone crazy, she replied, why, how did I know you'd notice? I've been cooking for you men for the last 20 years, and in all that time I ain't heard no word to let me know you wasn't just eating hay. When a study was made a few years ago on runaway wives, what do you think was discovered to be the main reason wives ran away? It was lack of appreciation. And I'd bet that a similar study made of runaway husbands would come out the same way. We often take our spouses so much for granted that we never let them know we appreciate them. A member of one of our classes told of a request made by his wife. She and a group of other women in her church were involved in a self-improvement program. She asked her husband to help her by listing six things he believed she could do to help her become a better wife. He reported to the class, I was surprised by such a request. Frankly, it would have been easy for me to list six things I would like to change about her my heavens, she could have listed a thousand things she would like to change about me but I didn't. I said to her, let me think about it and give you an answer in the morning. The next morning I got up very early and called the florist and had them send six red roses to my wife with a note saying, I can't think of six things I would like to change about you. I love you the way you are. When I arrived at home that evening, who do you think greeted me at the door, that's right. My wife. She was almost in tears. Needless to say, I was extremely glad I had not criticized her as she had requested. The following Sunday at church, after she had reported the results of her assignment, several women with whom she had been studying came up to me and said, that was the most considerate thing I have ever heard. It was then I realized the power of appreciation. Florence Siegfeld, the most spectacular producer who ever dazzled Broadway, gained his reputation by his subtle ability to glorify the American girl. Time after time, he took drab little creatures that no one ever looked at twice and transformed them on the stage into glamorous visions of mystery and seduction. Knowing the value of appreciation and confidence, he made women feel beautiful by the sheer power of his gallantry and consideration. He was practical. He raised the salary of chorus girls from $30 a week to as high as $175. And he was also chivalrous. On opening night at the Follies, he sent telegrams to the stars in the cast, and he deluged every chorus girl in the show with American Beauty Roses. I once succumbed to the fat of fasting and went for six days and nights without eating. It wasn't difficult. I was less hungry at the end of the sixth day than I was at the end of the second. Yet I know, as you know, people who would think they had committed a crime if they let their families or employees go for six days without food, but they will let them go for six days and six weeks and sometimes 60 years without giving them the hearty appreciation that they crave almost as much as they crave food. When Alfred Lund, one of the great actors of his time, played the leading role in Reunion in Vienna, he said, there is nothing I need so much as nourishment for my self-esteem. We nourish the bodies of our children and friends and employees, but how seldom do we nourish their self-esteem. We provide them with roast beef and potatoes to build energy, but we neglect to give them kind words of appreciation that would sing in their memories for years like the music of the morning stars. Paul Harvey, 
in one of his radio broadcasts, the rest of the story, told how showing sincere appreciation can change a person's life. He reported that years ago a teacher in Detroit asked Stevie Morris to help her find a mouse that was lost in the classroom. You see, she appreciated the fact that nature had given Stevie something no one else in the room had. Nature had given Stevie a remarkable pair of ears to compensate for his blind eyes. But this was really the first time Stevie had been shown appreciation for those talented ears. Now, years later, he says that this act of appreciation was the beginning of a new life. You see, from that time on he developed his gift of hearing and went on to become, under the stage name of Stevie Wonder, one of the great pop singers and songwriters of the 70s. Paul Orant, Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story, New York, Doubleday, 1977. Edited and compiled by Lynn Harvey. Copyright, C, by Paul and Incorporated. Some readers are saying right now as they read these lines, oh, fooey. Flattery. Bear oil. I've tried that stuff. It doesn't work not with intelligent people. Of course flattery seldom works with discerning people. It is shallow, selfish and insincere. It ought to fail, and it usually does. True, some people are so hungry, so thirsty, for appreciation that they will swallow anything just as a starving man will eat grass and fish worms. Even Queen Victoria was susceptible to flattery. Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli confessed that he put it on thick in dealing with the Queen. To use his exact words, he said he spread it on with a trowel. But Disraeli was one of the most polished, deft and adroit men who ever ruled the far-flung British Empire. He was a genius in his line. What would work for him wouldn't necessarily work for you and me. In the long run, flattery will do you more harm than good. Flattery is counterfeit, and like counterfeit money, it will eventually get you into trouble if you pass it to someone else. The difference between appreciation and flattery? That is simple. One is sincere, and the other insincere. One comes from the heart out, the other from the teeth out. One is unselfish, the other selfish. One is universally admired, the other universally condemned. I recently saw a bust of Mexican hero General Álvaro Obregón in the Chapultepec Palace in Mexico City. Below the bust are carved these wise words from General Obregón's philosophy, don't be afraid of enemies who attack you. Be afraid of the friends who flatter you. No. 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 I am not suggesting flattery. Far from it. I'm talking about a new way of life. Let me repeat. I am talking about a new way of life. King George V had a set of six maxims displayed on the walls of his study at Buckingham Palace. One of these maxims said, teach me neither to proffer nor receive cheap praise. That's all flattery is cheap praise. I once read a definition of flattery that may be worth repeating, flattery is telling the other person precisely what he thinks about himself. Use what language you will, said Ralph Waldo Emerson, you can never say anything but what you are. If all we had to do was flatter, everybody would catch on, and we should all be experts in human relations. When we are not engaged in thinking about some definite problem, we usually spend about 95% of our time thinking about ourselves. Now, if we stop thinking about ourselves for a while, and begin to think of the other person's good points, we won't have to resort to flattery so cheap and false that it can be spotted almost before it is out of the mouth. One of the most neglected virtues of our daily existence is appreciation, somehow, we neglect to praise our son or daughter when he or she brings home a good report card, and we fail to encourage our children when they first succeed in baking a cake or building a birdhouse. Nothing pleases children more than this kind of parental interest and approval. The next time you enjoy filet mignon at the club, send word to the chef that it was excellently prepared. And when a tired salesperson shows you unusual courtesy, please mention it. Every minister, lecturer and public speaker knows the discouragement of pouring himself or herself out to an audience and not receiving a single ripple of appreciative comment. What applies to professionals applies doubly to workers in offices, shops and factories and our families and friends. In our interpersonal relations we should never forget that all our associates are human beings and hunger for appreciation. It is the legal tender that all souls enjoy. 
Try leaving a friendly trail of little sparks of gratitude on your daily trips. You will be surprised how they will set small flames of friendship that will be rose beacons on your next visit. Pamela Dunham of New Fairfield, Connecticut, had among her responsibilities on her job the supervision of a janitor who was doing a very poor job. The other employees would jeer at him and litter the hallways too. Show him what a bad job he was doing. It was so bad productive time was being lost in the shop. Without success, Pam tried various ways to motivate this person. She noticed that occasionally he did a particularly good piece of work. She made a point to praise him for it in front of the other people. Each day the job he did all around got better, and pretty soon he started doing all his work efficiently. Now he does an excellent job, and other people give him appreciation and recognition. Honest appreciation got results, where criticism and ridicule failed. Hurting people not only does not change them, it is never called for. There is an old saying that I have cut out and pasted on my mirror where I cannot help but see it every day, I shall pass this way but once, any good, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Emerson said, every man I meet is my superior in some way, in that, I learn of him. If that was true of Emerson, isn't it likely to be a thousand times more true of you and me? Let's cease thinking of our accomplishments, our wants. Let's try to figure out the other person's good points. Then forget flattery. Give honest, sincere appreciation. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise, and people will cherish your words and treasure them and repeat them over a lifetime, repeat them years after you have forgotten them. Principle 2. Give honest and sincere appreciation. 3. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walk say a lonely way I often went fishing up in Maine during the summer. Personally I am very fond of strawberries and cream, but I have found that for some strange reason, fish prefer worms. So when I went fishing, I didn't think about what I wanted. I thought about what they wanted. I didn't bait the hook with strawberries and cream. Rather, I dangled a worm or a grasshopper in front of the fish and said, wouldn't you like to have that? Why not use the same common sense when fishing for people? That is what Lloyd George, Great Britain's Prime Minister during World War I, did. When someone asked him how he managed to stay in power after the other wartime leaders Wilson, Orlando, and Clemenceau had been forgotten, he replied that, if his staying on top might be attributed to any one thing, it would be to his having learned that it was necessary to bait the hook to suit the fish. Why talk about what we want? That is childish. Absurd. Of course, you are interested in what you want. You are eternally interested in it. But no one else is. The rest of us are just like you, we are interested in what we want. So the only way centimeters earth to influence other people is to talk about what they want and show them how to get it. Remember that tomorrow when you are trying to get somebody to do something. If, for example, you don't want your children to smoke, don't preach at them, and don't talk about what you want, but show them that cigarettes may keep them from making the basketball team more. Winning the 100-yard dash. This is a good thing to remember regardless of whether you are dealing with children or calves or chimpanzees. For example, one day Ralph Waldo Emerson and his son tried to get a calf into the barn. But they made the common mistake of thinking only of what they wanted, Emerson pushed and his son pulled. But the calf was doing just what they were doing. He was thinking only of what he wanted, so he stiffened his legs and stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The Irish housemaid saw their predicament. She couldn't write essays and books, but, on this occasion at least, she had more horse sense, or calf sense, than Emerson had. She thought of what the calf wanted, so she put her maternal finger in the calf's mouth and let the calf suck her finger as she gently led him into the barn. Every act you have ever performed since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. How about the time you gave a large contribution to the Red Cross? Yes, that is no exception to the rule. You gave the Red Cross the donation because you wanted to lend a helping hand, you wanted to do a beautiful, unselfish, divine act. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me.
If you hadn't wanted that feeling more than you wanted your money, you would not have made the contribution. Of course, you might have made the contribution because you were ashamed to refuse or because a customer asked you to do it. But one thing is certain. You made the contribution because you wanted something. Harry A. Overstreet in his illuminating book Influencing Human Behavior said, Action springs out of what we fundamentally desire, and the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, in politics, is, first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Andrew Carnegie, the poverty-stricken Scotch lad who started to work at two cents an hour and finally gave away 365 million, learned early in life that the only way to influence people is to talk in terms of what the other person wants. He attended school only four years, yet he learned how to handle people. To illustrate, his sister-in-law was worried sick over her two boys. They were at Yale, and they were so busy with their own affairs that they neglected to write home and paid no attention, whatever to their mother's frantic letters. Then Carnegie offered to wager $100 that he could get an answer by return mail without even asking for it. Someone called his bet, so he wrote his nephews a chatty letter, mentioning casually in a postscript that he was sending each one a $5 bill. He neglected, however, to enclose the money. Back came replies by return mail thanking dear Uncle Andrew for his kind note, and you can finish the sentence yourself. Another example of persuading comes from Stan Novak of Cleveland, Ohio, a participant in our course. Stan came home from work one evening to find his youngest son, Tim, kicking and screaming on the living room floor. He was to start kindergarten the next day and was protesting that he would not go. Stan's normal reaction would have been to banish the child to his room and tell him he just better make up his mind to go. He had no choice. But tonight, recognizing that this would not really help Tim start kindergarten in the best frame of mind, Stan sat down. And thought, if I were Tim, why would I be excited about going to kindergarten? He and his wife made a list of all the fun things Tim would do such as finger painting, singing songs, making new friends. Then they put them into action. We all started finger painting on the kitchen table my wife, Lil, my other son Bob, and myself, all having fun. Soon Tim was peeping around the corner. Next he was begging to participate. Oh, no. Do you have to go to kindergarten first to learn how to finger paint? With all the enthusiasm I could muster I went through the list talking in terms he could understand telling him all the fun he would have in kindergarten. The next morning, I thought I was the first one up. I went downstairs and found Tim sitting sound asleep in the living room chair. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm waiting to go to kindergarten. I don't want to be late. The enthusiasm of our entire family had aroused in Tim an eager want that no amount of discussion or threat could have possibly accomplished. Tomorrow you may want to persuade somebody to do something. Before you speak, pause and ask yourself, how can I make this person want to do it? That question will stop us from rushing into a situation heedlessly, with futile chatter about our desires. At one time I rented the grand ballroom of a certain New York hotel for 20 nights in each season, in order to hold a series of lectures. At the beginning of one season, I was suddenly informed that I should have to pay almost three times as much rent as formerly. This news reached me after the tickets had been printed and distributed and all announcements had been made. Naturally, I didn't want to pay the increase, but what was the use of talking to the hotel about what I wanted? They were interested only in what they wanted. So a couple of days later I went to see the manager. I was a bit shocked when I got your letter, I said, but I don't blame you at all. If I had been in your position, I should probably have written a similar letter myself. Your duty as the manager of the hotel is to make all the profit possible. If you don't do that, you will be fired, and you ought to be fired. Now, let's take a piece of paper and write down the advantages and the disadvantages that will accrue to you if you insist on this increase in rent. Then I took a letterhead and ran a line through the center and headed one column advantages and the other column disadvantages. I wrote down under the head advantages these words, ballroom free. 
Then I went on to say, you will have the advantage of having the ballroom free to rent for dances and conventions. That is a big advantage, for affairs like that will pay you much more than you can get for a series of lectures. If I tie your ballroom up for 20 nights during the course of the season, it is sure to mean a loss of some very profitable business to you. Now, let's consider the disadvantages. First, instead of increasing your income from me, you are going to decrease it. In fact, you are going to wipe it out, because I cannot pay the rent you are asking. I shall be forced to hold these lectures at some other place. There's another disadvantage to you also. These lectures attract crowds of educated and cultured people to your hotel. That is good advertising for you, isn't it? In fact, if you spend $5,000 advertising in the newspapers, you couldn't bring as many people to look at your hotel as I can bring by these lectures. That is worth a lot to a hotel, isn't it? As I talked, I wrote these two disadvantages under the proper heading and handed the sheet of paper to the manager, saying, I wish you would carefully consider both the advantages and disadvantages that are going to accrue to you and then give me your final decision. I received a letter the next day, informing me that my rent would be increased only 50% instead of 300%. Mind you, I got this reduction without saying a word about what I wanted. I talk all the time about what the other person wanted and how he could get it. Suppose I had done the human, natural thing. Suppose I had stormed into his office and said, what do you mean by raising my rent 300% when you know the tickets have been printed and the announcements made? 300%? Ridiculous. Absurd. I won't pay it. What would have happened then? An argument would have begun to steam and boil and sputter, and you know how arguments end. Even if I had convinced him that he was wrong, his pride would have made it difficult for him to back down and give in. Here is one of the best bits of advice ever given about the fine art of human relationships. If there is any one secret of success, said Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so good, I want to repeat it, if there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so simple, so obvious, that anyone ought to see the truth of it at a glance, yet 90% of the people on this earth ignore it 90% of the time. An example? Look at the letters that come across your desk tomorrow morning, and you will find that most of them violate this important canon of common sense. Take this one, a letter written by the head of the radio department of an advertising agency with offices scattered across the continent. This letter was sent to the managers of local radio stations throughout the country. I have set down, in brackets, my reactions to each paragraph. Mr. John Blank, Blankville, Indiana Dear Mr. Blank, the company desires to retain its position in advertising agency leadership in the radio field. Who cares what your company desires? I am worried about my own problems. The bank is foreclosing the mortgage on my house, the bugs are destroying the hollyhocks, the stock market tumbled yesterday. I missed the 8.15 this morning, I wasn't invited to the Jones dance last night, the doctor tells me I have high blood pressure and neuritis and dandruff. And then what happens? I come down to the office this morning worried, open my mail and here is some little whippersnapper off in New York yapping about what his company wants. Bah! If he only realized what sort of impression his letter makes, he would get out of the advertising business and start manufacturing sheep dip. This agency's national advertising accounts were the bulwark of the network. Our subsequent clearances of station time have kept us at the top of agencies year after year. You are big and rich and right at the top, are you? So what? I don't give two whoops in Hades if you are as big as... General Motors and General Electric and the general staff of the U.S. Army all combined. If you had as much sense as a half-witted hummingbird, you would realize that I am interested in how big I am not how big you are. All this talk about your enormous success makes me feel small and unimportant. We desire to service our accounts with the last word on radio station information. You desire. You desire. You unmitigated ass. I'm not interested in what you desire or what the President of the United States desires. 
Let me tell you once and for all that I am interested in what I desire, and you haven't said a word about that yet in this absurd letter of yours. Will you, therefore, put the company on your preferred list for weekly station information every single detail that will be useful to an agency in intelligently booking time? Preferred list. You have your nerve. You make me feel insignificant by your big talk about your company, and then you ask me to put you on a preferred list, and you don't even say please when you ask it. A prompt acknowledgement of this letter, giving us your latest doings, will be mutually helpful. You fool. You mail me a cheap form letter a letter scattered far and wide like the autumn leaves, and you have the gall to ask me, when I am worried about the mortgage, and the hollyhocks in my blood pressure, to sit down and dictate a personal note acknowledging your form letter, and you ask me to do it promptly. What do you mean, promptly? Don't you know I am just as busy as you are, or, at least, I like to think I am. And while we are on the subject, who gave you the lordly right to order me around, you say it will be mutually helpful. At last, at last, you have begun to see my viewpoint. But you are vague about how it will be to my advantage. Very truly yours, John Doe Manager Radio Department P.S. The enclosed reprint from the Blankville Journal will be of interest to you, and you may want to broadcast it over your station. Finally, down here in the postscript, you mentioned something that may help me solve one of my problems. Why didn't you begin your letter with, but what's the use? Any advertising man who is guilty of perpetrating such drivel as you have sent me has something wrong with his medulla oblongata. You don't need a letter giving our latest doings. What you need is a quart of iodine in your thyroid gland. Now, if people who devote their lives to advertising, and who pose as experts in the art of influencing people to buy, if they write a letter like that, what can we expect from the butcher and baker or the auto mechanic? Here is another letter, written by the superintendent of a large freight terminal to a student of this course, Edward Vermelin. What effect did this letter have on the man to whom it was addressed? Read it and then I'll tell you. A. Zarega Sons Incorporated, 28 Front St. Brooklyn, New York, 11201 Attention, Mr. Edward Vermelin, Gentlemen, the operations of our outbound rail receiving station are handicapped because a material percentage of the total business is delivered us in the late afternoon. This condition results in congestion, overtime on the part of our forces, delays to trucks, and in some cases delays to freight. On November 10, we received from your company a lot of 510 pieces, which reached here at 4.20 p.m. We solicit your cooperation toward overcoming the undesirable effects arising from late receipt of freight. May we ask that, on days on which you ship the volume which was received on the above date, effort be made either to get the truck here earlier or to deliver us part of the freight during the morning. The advantage that would accrue to you under such an arrangement would be that of more expeditious discharge of your trucks and the assurance that your business would go forward on the date of its receipt. Very truly yours, J.B. Supt. After reading this letter, Mr. Vermelin, sales manager for A. Zarega Sons Incorporated, sent it to me with the following comment, this letter had the reverse effect from that which was intended. The letter begins by describing the terminal's difficulties, in which we are not interested, generally speaking. Our cooperation is then requested without any thought as to whether it would inconvenience us, and then, finally, in the last paragraph, the fact is mentioned that, if we do cooperate it will mean more expeditious discharge of our trucks with the assurance that our freight will go forward on the date of its receipt. In other words, that in which we are most interested is mentioned last, and the whole effect is one of raising a spirit of antagonism, rather than of cooperation. Let's see if we can't rewrite and improve this letter. Let's not waste any time talking about our problems. As Henry Ford admonishes, let's get the other person's point of view and see things from his or her angle, as well as from our own. Here is one way of revising the letter. It may not be the best way, but isn't it an improvement? Mr. Edward Vermelin percent A. Zarega Sons Incorporated, 28 Front St. Brooklyn, New York, 11201. Dear Mr. Vermelin, your company has been one of our good customers for 14 years. Naturally, we are very grateful for your patronage and are eager to give you the speedy, efficient service you deserve. However, we regret to say that it isn't possible for us to do that 
when your trucks bring us a large shipment late in the afternoon, as they did on November 10th. Why? Because many other customers make late afternoon deliveries also. Naturally, that causes congestion. That means your trucks are held up unavoidably at the pier, and sometimes even your freight is delayed. That's bad, but it can be avoided. If you make your deliveries at the pier in the morning when possible, your trucks will be able to keep moving, your freight will get immediate attention, and our workers will get home early at night to enjoy a dinner of the delicious macaroni and noodles that you manufacture. Regardless of when your shipments arrive, we shall always cheerfully do all in our power to serve you promptly. You are busy. Please don't trouble to answer this note. Yours truly, J.B. Supt. Barbara Anderson, who worked in a bank in New York, desired to move to Phoenix, Arizona, because of the health of her son. Using the principles she had learned in our course, she wrote the following letter to 12 banks in Phoenix, Dear Sir, my 10 years of bank experience should be of interest to a rapidly growing bank like yours. In various capacities in bank operations with the Bankers Trust Company in New York, leading to my present assignment as branch manager, I have acquired skills in all phases of banking including depositor relations, credits, loans and administration. I will be relocating to Phoenix in May, and I am sure I can contribute to your growth and profit. I will be in Phoenix the week of April 3, and would appreciate the opportunity to show you how I can help your bank meet its goals. Sincerely, Barbara L. Anderson. Do you think Mrs. Anderson received any response from that letter? 11 of the 12 banks invited her to be interviewed, and she had a choice of which banks offered to accept. Why? Mrs. Anderson did not state what she wanted, but wrote in the letter how she could help them and focused on their wants, not her own. Thousands of salespeople are pounding the pavements today, tired, discouraged, and underpaid. Why? Because they are always thinking only of what they want. They don't realize that neither you nor I want to buy anything. If we did, we would go out and buy it. But both of us are eternally interested in solving our problems. And if salespeople can show us how their services or merchandise will help us solve our problems, they won't need to sell us. We'll buy. And customers like to feel that they are buying not being sold. Yet many salespeople spend a lifetime in selling without seeing things from the customer's angle. For example, for many years I lived in Forest Hills, a little community of private homes in the center of Greater New York. One day as I was rushing to the station, I chanced to meet a real estate operator who had bought and sold property in that area for many years. He knew Forest Hills well, so I hurriedly asked him whether or not my stucco house was built with metal lath or hollow tile. He said he didn't know and told me what I already knew, that I could find out by calling the Forest Hills Garden Association. The following morning, I received a letter from him. Did he give me the information I wanted? He could have gotten it in 60 seconds by a telephone call. But he didn't. He told me again that I could get it by telephoning and then asked me to let him handle my insurance. He was not interested in helping me. He was interested only in helping himself. J. Howard Lucas of Birmingham, Alabama, tells how two salespeople from the same company handled the same type of situation. He reported, several years ago I was on the management team of a small company. Headquartered near us was the district office of a large insurance company. Their agents were assigned territories, and our company was assigned to two agents, whom I shall refer to as Carl and John. One morning, Carl dropped by our office and casually mentioned that his company had just introduced a new life insurance policy for executives and thought we might be interested later on and he would get back to us when he had more information on it. The same day, John saw us on the sidewalk while returning from a coffee break, and he shouted, Hey Luke, hold up, I have some great news for you fellows. He hurried over and very excitedly told us about an executive life insurance policy his company had introduced that very day. It was the same policy that Carl had casually mentioned. He wanted us to have one of the first issued. He gave us a few important facts about the coverage and ended saying, the policy is so new, I'm going to have someone from the home office come out tomorrow and explain it. Now, in the meantime, let's get the application signed and on the way, so he can have more information to work with. 
his enthusiasm aroused in us an eager want for this policy, even though we still did not have details when they were made available to us, they confirmed John's initial understanding of the policy, and he not only sold each of us a policy, but later doubled our coverage. Carl could have had those sales, but he made no effort to arouse in us any desire for the policies. The world is full of people who are grabbing and self-seeking. So the rare individual who unselfishly tries to serve others has an enormous advantage. He has little competition. Oh, indeed. Young, a noted lawyer and one of America's great business leaders, once said, people who can put themselves in the place of other people who can understand the workings of their minds need never worry about what the future has in store for them. If out of reading this book you get just one thing an increased tendency to think always in terms of other people's point of view and see things from their angle, if you get that one thing out of this book, it may easily prove to be one of the building blocks of your career. Looking at the other person's point of view and arousing in him an eager want for something is not to be construed as manipulating that person so that he will do something that is only for your benefit and his detriment. Each party should gain from the negotiation. In the letters to Mr. Vermelin, both the sender and the receiver of the correspondence gained by implementing what was suggested. Both the bank and Mrs. Anderson won by her letter, in that the bank obtained a valuable employee and Mrs. Anderson a suitable job. And in the example of John's sale of insurance to Mr. Lucas, both gained through this transaction. Another example in which everybody gains through this principle of arousing an eager want comes from Michael E. Whitten of Warwick, Rhode Island who is a territory salesman for the Shell Oil Company. Mike wanted to become the number one salesperson in his district, but one service station was holding him back. It was run by an older man who could not be motivated to clean up his station. It was in such poor shape that sales were declining significantly. This manager would not listen to any of Mike's pleas to upgrade the station. After many exhortations and heart-to-heart -heart talks all, of which had no impact Mike decided to invite the manager to visit the newest Shell station in his territory. The manager was so impressed by the facilities at the new station that when Mike visited him the next time, his station was cleaned up and he recorded a sales increase. This enabled Mike to reach the number one spot in his district. All his talking and discussion hadn't helped, but by arousing an eager want in the manager, by showing him the modern station, he had accomplished his goal, and both the manager and Mike benefited. Most people go through college and learn to read Virgil and master the mysteries of calculus without ever discovering how their own minds function. For instance, I once gave a course in effective speaking for the young college graduates who were entering the employ of the Carrier Corporation, the large air conditioner manufacturer. One of the participants wanted to persuade the others to play basketball in their free time, and this is about what he said, I want you to come out and play basketball. I like to play basketball, but the last few times I've been to the gymnasium there haven't been enough people to get up a game. Two or three of us got to throwing the ball around the other night and I got a black eye. I wish all of you would come down tomorrow night. I want to play basketball. Did he talk about anything you want? Do you don't want to go to a gymnasium that no one else goes to, do you? You don't care about what he wants. You don't want to get a black eye. Could he have shown you how to get the things you want by using the gymnasium? Surely. More pep. Keener edge to the appetite. Clearer brain. Fun. Games. Basketball. To repeat Professor Overstreet's wise advice, first, arouse in the other person an eager want he who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. One of the students in the author's training course was worried about his little boy. The child was underweight and refused to eat properly. His parents used the usual method. They scolded and nagged. Mother wants you to eat this and that. Father wants you to grow up to be a big man. Did the boy pay any attention to these pleas? Just about as much as you pay to one fleck of sand on a sandy beach. No one with a trace of horse sense would expect a child three years old to react to the viewpoint of a father 30 years old. Yet that was precisely what that father had expected. It was absurd. He finally saw that. So he said to himself, what does that boy want? How can I tie up what I want to what he wants? It was easy for the father when he starting thinking about it. 
His boy had a tricycle that he loved to ride up and down the sidewalk in front of the house in Brooklyn. A few doors down the street lived a bully a bigger boy who would pull the little boy off his tricycle and ride it himself. Naturally, the little boy would run screaming to his mother and she would have to come out and take the bully off the tricycle and put her little boy on again, this happened almost every day. What did the little boy want? It didn't take a Sherlock Holmes to answer that one. His pride, his anger, his desire for a feeling of importance all the strongest emotions in his makeup, goaded him to get revenge, to smash the bully in the nose. And when his father explained that the boy would be able to wallop the daylights out of the bigger kids someday, if he would only eat the things his mother wanted him to eat, when his father promised him that there was no longer any problem of dietetics. That boy would have eaten spinach, sauerkraut, salt mackerel anything, in order to be big enough to whip the bully who had humiliated him so often. After solving that problem, the parents tackled another, the little boy had the unholy habit of wetting his bed. He slept with his grandmother. In the morning, his grandmother would wake up and feel the sheet and say, look, Johnny, what you did again last night. He would say, no, I didn't do it. You did it. Scolding, spanking, shaming him, reiterating that the parents didn't want him to do it none of these things, kept the bed dry. So the parents asked, how can we make this boy want to stop wetting his bed? What were his wants? First, he wanted to wear pajamas like daddy instead of wearing a nightgown like grandmother. Grandmother was getting fed up with his nocturnal iniquities, so she gladly offered to buy him a pair of pajamas, if you would reform. Second, he wanted a bed of his own. Grandma didn't object. His mother took him to a department store in Brooklyn, winked at the sales girl, and said, here is a little gentleman who would like to do some shopping. The sales girl made him feel important by saying, young man, what can I show you? He stood a couple of inches taller and said, I want to buy a bed for myself. When he was shown the one his mother wanted him to buy, she winked at the sales girl and the boy was persuaded to buy it. The bed was delivered the next day. And that night, when father came home, the little boy ran to the door shouting, Daddy! Daddy! Come upstairs and see my bed that I bought. The father, looking at the bed, obeyed Charles Schwab's injunction, he was hearty in his approbation and lavish in his praise. You are not going to wet this bed, are you? The father said. Oh, no, no. I am not going to wet this bed. The boy kept his promise, for his pride was involved. That was his bed. He and he alone had bought it. And he was wearing pajamas now like a little man. He wanted to act like a man. And he did. Another father, KT. Dutchman, a telephone engineer, a student of this course, couldn't get his three-year-old daughter to eat breakfast food. The usual scolding, pleading, coaxing methods had all ended in futility. So the parents asked themselves, how can we make her want to do it? The little girl loved to imitate her mother, to feel big and grown up, so one morning they put her on a chair and let her make the breakfast food. At just the psychological moment, father drifted into the kitchen while she was stirring the cereal and she said, Oh, look, daddy, I am making the cereal this morning. She ate two helpings of the cereal without any coaxing, because she was interested in it. She had achieved a feeling of importance. She had found in making the cereal an avenue of self-expression. William Winter once remarked that self-expression is the dominant necessity of human nature. Why can't we adapt the same psychology to business dealings? When we have a brilliant idea, instead of making others think it is ours, why not let them cook and stir the idea themselves? They will then regard it as their own. They will like it and maybe eat a couple of helpings of it. Remember, first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Principle 3 Arouse in the other person an eager want. In a nutshell fundamental techniques in handling people principle 1 don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Principle 2 give honest and sincere appreciation. Principle 3 arouse in the other person an eager want. Part 2 ways to make people like you. 1. Do this and you'll be welcome anywhere. Why read this book to find out how to win friends? Why not study the technique of the greatest winner of friends the world has ever known? Who is he? 
you may meet him tomorrow coming down the street. When you get within 10 feet of him, he will begin to wag his tail. If you stop and pat him, he will almost jump out of his skin to show you how much he likes you. And you know that behind this show of affection on his part, there are no ulterior motives, he doesn't want to sell you any real estate, and he doesn't want to marry you. Did you ever stop to think that a dog is the only animal that doesn't have to work for a living? A hen has to lay eggs, a cow has to give milk, and a canary has to sing. But a dog makes his living by giving you nothing but love. When I was five years old, my father bought a little yellow-haired pup for 50 cents. He was the light and joy of my childhood. Every afternoon about 4.30, he would sit in the front yard with his beautiful eyes staring steadfastly at the path, and as soon as he heard my voice, or saw me swinging my dinner pail through the buck brush, he was off like a shot, racing breathlessly up the hill, to greet me with leaps of joy and barks of sheer ecstasy. Tippy was my constant companion for five years. Then one tragic night I shall never forget it, he was killed within ten feet of my head, killed by lightning. Tippy's death was the tragedy of my boyhood. You never read a book on psychology, Tippy. You didn't need to. You knew by some divine instinct that you can make more friends in two months by becoming genuinely interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. Let me repeat that. You can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. Yet I know, and you know people who blunder through life trying to wigwag other people into becoming interested in them. Of course, it doesn't work. People are not interested in you. They are not interested in me. They are interested in themselves morning, noon and after dinner. The New York Telephone Company made a detailed study of telephone conversations to find out which word is the most frequently used. You have guessed it, it is the personal pronoun I. 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 It was used 3,900 times in 500 telephone conversations. I. 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 When you see a group photograph that you are in, whose picture do you look for first? If we merely try to impress people and get people interested in us, we will never have many true, sincere friends. Friends, real friends, are not made that way. Napoleon tried it, and in his last meeting with Josephine he said, Josephine, I have been as fortunate as any man ever was on this earth, and yet, at this hour, you are the only person in the world on whom I can rely. And historians doubt whether he could rely even on her. Alfred Adler, the famous Viennese psychologist, wrote a book entitled, What Life Should Mean to You. In that book he says, it is the individual who is not interested in his fellow men who has the greatest difficulties in life and provides the greatest injury to others. It is from among such individuals that all human failures spring. You may read scores of erudite tomes on psychology without coming across a statement more significant for you and for me. Adler's statement is so rich with meaning that I am going to repeat it in italics, it is the individual who is not interested in his fellow men who has the greatest difficulties in life and provides the greatest injury to others. It is from among such individuals that all human failures spring. I once took a course in short story writing at New York University, and during that course the editor of a leading magazine talked to our class. He said he could pick up any one of the dozens of stories that drifted across his desk every day, and after reading a few paragraphs he could feel whether or not the author liked people. If the author doesn't like people, he said, people won't like his or her stories. This hard-boiled editor stopped twice in the course of his talk on fiction writing and apologized for preaching a sermon. I am telling you, he said, the same things your preacher would tell you, but remember, you have to be interested in people if you want to be a successful writer of stories. If that is true of writing fiction, you can be sure it is true of dealing with people face to face. I spent an evening in the dressing room of Howard Thurston the last time he appeared on Broadway Thurston was the acknowledged dean of magicians. For 40 years he had traveled all over the world, time and again, creating illusions, mystifying audiences, and making people gasp with astonishment. More than 60 million people had paid admission to his show, and he had made almost 2 million in profit. I asked Mr. Thurston to tell me the secret of his success. 
His schooling certainly had nothing to do with it, for he ran away from home as a small boy, became a hobo, rode in boxcars, slept in haystacks, begged his food from door to door, and learned to read by looking out of boxcars at signs along the railway. Did he have a superior knowledge of magic? No, he told me hundreds of books had been written about legerdemain, and scores of people knew as much about it as he did. But he had two things that the others didn't have. First, he had the ability to put his personality across the footlights. He was a master showman. He knew human nature. Everything he did, every gesture, every intonation of his voice, every lifting of an eyebrow, had been carefully rehearsed in advance, and his actions were timed to split seconds. But, in addition to that, Thurston had a genuine interest in people. He told me that many magicians would look at the audience and say to themselves, well, there is a bunch of suckers out there, a bunch of hicks. I'll fold them all right. But Thurston's method was totally different. He told me that every time he went on stage he said to himself, I am grateful, because these people come to see me, they make it possible for me to make my living in a very agreeable way. I'm going to give them the very best I possibly can. He declared he never stepped in front of the footlights without first saying to himself over and over, I love my audience. I love my audience. Ridiculous? Absurd? Do you are privileged to think anything you like. I am merely passing it on to you without comment as a recipe used by one of the most famous magicians of all time. George Dyke of North Warren, Pennsylvania, was forced to retire from his service station business after 30 years, when a new highway was constructed over the side of his station. It wasn't long before the idle days of retirement began to bore him, so he started filling in his time trying to play music on his old fiddle. Soon he was traveling the area to listen to music and talk with many of the accomplished fiddlers. In his humble and friendly way he became generally interested in learning the background and interests of every musician he met. Although he was not a great fiddler himself, he made many friends in this pursuit. He attended competitions and soon became known to the country music fans in the eastern part of the United States as Uncle George, the fiddle scraper from Kinsua County. When we heard Uncle George, he was 72 and enjoying every minute of his life. By having a sustained interest in other people, he created a new life for himself at a time when most people consider their productive years over. That too, was one of the secrets of Theodore Roosevelt's astonishing popularity. Even his servants loved him. His valet, James E. Amos, wrote a book about him entitled Theodore Roosevelt, Hero to His Valet. In that book Amos relates this illuminating incident, my wife one time asked the president about a Bob White. She had never seen one and he described it to her fully. Sometime later, the telephone at our cottage rang. Amos and his wife lived in a little cottage on the Roosevelt estate of Oyster Bay. My wife answered it, and it was Mr. Roosevelt himself. He had called her, he said, to tell her that there was a Bob White outside her window and that, if she would look out she might see it. Little things like that were so characteristic of him. Whenever he went by our cottage, even though we were out of sight, we would hear him call out, Ooh, Annie, or Ooh, James. It was just a friendly greeting as he went by. How could employees keep from liking a man like that? How could anyone keep from liking him? Roosevelt called at the White House one day, when the president and Mrs. Taft were away. His honest liking for humble people was shown by the fact that he greeted all the old White House servants by name, even the scullery maids. When he saw Alice, the kitchen maid, writes Archie Butt, he asked her if she still made cornbread. Alice told him that she sometimes made it for the servants, but no one ate it upstairs. They show bad taste, Roosevelt boomed, and I'll tell the president so when I see him. Alice brought a piece to him on a plate, and he went over to the office eating it as he went, and greeting gardeners and laborers as he passed, he addressed each person just as he had addressed them in the past. Ike Hoover, who had been head usher at the White House for 40 years, said with tears in his eyes, it is the only happy day we had in nearly two years, and not one of us would exchange it for a hundred dollar bill. The same concern for the seemingly unimportant people helped sales representative Edward M. Sykes Jr. of Chatham, New Jersey, retain an account. Many years ago, he reported, 
I called on customers for Johnson & Johnson in the Massachusetts area. One account was a drugstore in Hingham. Whenever I went into this store I would always talk to the soda clerk and sales clerk for a few minutes before talking to the owner to obtain his order. One day I went up to the owner of the store and he told me to leave as he was not interested in buying J&J &J products anymore because he felt they were concentrating their activities on food and discount stores to the detriment of the small drugstore. I left with my tail between my legs and drove around the town for several hours. Finally, I decided to go back and try at least to explain our position to the owner of the store. When I returned I walked in and as usual said hello to the soda clerk and sales clerk. When I walked up to the owner, he smiled at me and welcomed me back. He then gave me double the usual order, I looked at him with surprise and asked him what had happened since my visit only a few hours earlier. He pointed to the young man at the soda fountain and said that, after I had left, the boy had come over and said that I was one of the few salespeople that called on the store that even bothered to say hello to him and to the others in the store. He told the owner that if any salesperson deserved his business, it was I. The owner agreed and remained a loyal customer. I never forgot that to be genuinely interested in other people is a most important quality for a salesperson to possess for any person, for that matter. I have discovered from personal experience that one can win the attention and time and cooperation of even the most sought-after people by becoming genuinely interested in them. Let me illustrate. Years ago I conducted a course in fiction writing at the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences, and we wanted such distinguished and busy authors as Kathleen Norris, Fanny Hurst, Ida Tarbell, Albert Payson Turhune and Rupert Hughes to come to Brooklyn, and give us the benefit of their experiences. So we wrote them, saying we admired their work and were deeply interested in getting their advice and learning the secrets of their success. Each of these letters was signed by about 150 students. We said we realized that these authors were busy too busy to prepare a lecture. So we enclosed a list of questions for them to answer about themselves and their methods of work. They liked that. Who wouldn't like it? So they left their homes and traveled to Brooklyn to give us a helping hand. By using the same method, I persuaded Leslie M. Shaw, Secretary of the Treasury in Theodore Roosevelt's cabinet, George W. Wickersham, Attorney General in Taft's cabinet, William Jennings Bryan, Franklin D. Roosevelt and many other prominent men to come to talk to the students of my courses in public speaking. All of us, be we workers in a factory, clerks in an office, or even a king upon his throne all of us like people who admire us. Take the German Kaiser, for example. At the close of World War I he was probably the most savagely and universally despised man on this earth. Even his own nation turned against him when he fled over into Holland to save his neck. The hatred against him was so intense that millions of people would have loved to tear him limb from limb or burn him at the stake. In the midst of all this forest fire fury, one little boy wrote the Kaiser a simple, sincere letter glowing with kindliness and admiration. This little boy said that, no matter what the others thought, he would always love Wilhelm as his emperor. The Kaiser was deeply touched by his letter and invited the little boy to come to see him. The boy came, so did his mother and the Kaiser married her. That little boy didn't need to read a book on how to win friends and influence people. He knew how instinctively, if we want to make friends, let's put ourselves out to do things for other people, things that require time, energy, unselfishness, and thoughtfulness. When the Duke of Windsor was Prince of Wales, he was scheduled to tour South America, and before he started out on that tour he spent months studying Spanish so that he could make public talks in the language of the country, and the South Americans loved him for it. For years I made it a point, to find out the birthdays of my friends. How? Although I haven't the foggiest bit of faith in astrology, I began by asking the other party whether he believed the date of one's birth has anything to do with character and disposition. I then asked him or her to tell me the month and day of birth. If he or she said November 24, for example, I kept repeating to myself, November 24, November 24. The minute my friend's back was turned, I wrote down the name and birthday, and later would transfer it to a birthday book. 
At the beginning of each year, I had these birthday dates scheduled in my calendar pad so that they came to my attention automatically. When the natal day arrived, there was my letter or telegram. What a hit it made. I was frequently the only person on earth who remembered. If we want to make friends, let's greet people with animation and enthusiasm. When somebody calls you on the telephone use the same psychology. Say hello in tones that bespeak how pleased you are to have the person call. Many companies train their telephone operators to greet all callers in a tone of voice that radiates interest and enthusiasm. The caller feels the company is concerned about them. Let's remember that when we answer the telephone tomorrow. Showing a genuine interest in others not only wins friends for you, but may develop in its customers a loyalty to your company. In an issue of the publication of the National Bank of North America of New York, the following letter from Madeline Rosedale, a depositor, was published, Eagle, publication of the National Bank of North America New York, March 31, 1978. I would like you to know how much I appreciate your staff. Everyone is so courteous, polite and helpful. What a pleasure it is, after waiting on a long line, to have the teller greet you pleasantly. Last year my mother was hospitalized for five months. Frequently I went to Marie Petrocello, a teller. She was concerned about my mother and inquired about her progress. Is there any doubt that Mrs. Rosedale will continue to use this bank? Charles R. Walters, of one of the large banks in New York City, was assigned to prepare a confidential report on a certain corporation. He knew of only one person who possessed the facts he needed so urgently. As Mr. Walters was ushered into the president's office, a young woman stuck her head through a door and told the president that she didn't have any stamps for him that day. I am collecting stamps for my 12-year-old son, the president explained to Mr. Walters. Mr. Walters stated his mission and began asking questions. The president was vague, general, nebulous. He didn't want to talk and apparently nothing could persuade him to talk. The interview was brief and barren. Frankly, I didn't know what to do, Mr. Walters said as he related the story to the class. Then I remembered what his secretary had said to him stamps, 12-year-old son. And I also recalled that the foreign department of our bank collected stamp stamps taken from letters pouring in from every continent washed by the seven seas. The next afternoon I called on this man and sent in word that I had some stamps for his boy. Was I ushered in with enthusiasm? Yes sir, he couldn't have shaken my hand with more enthusiasm if he had been running for Congress. He radiated smiles and goodwill. My George will love this one, he kept saying as he fondled the stamps. And look at this. This is a treasure. We spent half an hour talking stamps and looking at a picture of his boy, and he then devoted more than an hour of his time to giving me every bit of information I wanted without my even suggesting that he do it. He told me all he knew and then called in his subordinates and questioned them. He telephoned some of his associates. He loaded me down with facts, figures, reports and correspondence. In the parlance of newspaper reporters, I had a scoop. Here is another illustration, C.M. Naffel Jr. of Philadelphia had tried for years to sell fuel to a large chain store organization. But the chain store company continued to purchase its fuel from an out-of-town dealer and haul it right past the door of Naffel's office. Mr. Naffel made a speech one night before one of my classes, pouring out his hot wrath upon chain stores, branding them as a curse to the nation. And still he wondered why he couldn't sell them. I suggested that he try different tactics. To put it briefly, this is what happened. We staged a debate between members of the course on whether the spread of the chain store is doing the country more harm than good. Naffel, at my suggestion, took the negative side. He agreed to defend the chain stores and then went straight to an executive of the chain store organization that he despised and said, I am not here to try to sell fuel. I have come to ask you to do me a favor. He then told about his debate and said, I have come to you for help because I can't think of anyone else who would be more capable of giving me the facts I want. I'm anxious to win this debate and I'll deeply appreciate whatever help you can give me. Here is the rest of the story in Mr. Naffel's own words, I had asked this man for precisely one minute of his time. It was with that understanding 
that he consented to see me. After I had stated my case, he motioned me to a chair and talked to me for exactly 1 hour and 47 minutes. He called in another executive who had written a book on chain stores. He wrote to the National Chain Store Association and secured for me a copy of a debate on the subject. He feels that the chain store is rendering a real service to humanity. He is proud of what he is doing for hundreds of communities. His eyes fairly glowed as he talked, and I must confess that he opened my eyes to things I had never even dreamed of. He changed my whole mental attitude. As I was leaving, he walked with me to the door, put his arm around my shoulder, wished me well in my debate, and asked me to stop in and see him again and let him know how I made out. The last words he said to me were, please see me again later in the spring. I should like to place an order with you for fuel. To me that was almost a miracle. Here he was offering to buy fuel without my even suggesting it. I had made more headway in two hours by becoming genuinely interested in him and his problems than I could have made in 10 years trying to get him interested in me and my product. You didn't discover a new truth, Mr. Naffle, for a long time ago, a hundred years before Christ was born a famous old Roman poet, Publilius Cyrus, remarked, we are interested in others when they are interested in us. A show of interest, as with every other principle of human relations, must be sincere. It must pay off, not only for the person showing the interest, but for the person receiving the attention. It is a two-way street both parties benefit. Martin Ginsburg, who took her course in Long Island, New York, reported how the special interest a nurse took in him profoundly affected his life, it was Thanksgiving Day, and I was 10 years old. I was in a welfare ward of a city hospital and was scheduled to undergo major orthopedic surgery the next day. I knew that I could only look forward to months of confinement, convalescence and pain. My father was dead. My mother and I lived alone in a small apartment and we were on welfare. My mother was unable to visit me that day. As the day went on, I became overwhelmed with the feeling of loneliness, despair and fear. I knew my mother was home alone worrying about me, not having anyone to be with, not having anyone to eat with, and not even having enough money to afford a Thanksgiving Day dinner. The tears welled up in my eyes, and I stuck my head under the pillow and pulled the covers over it. I cried silently, but oh so bitterly, so much that my body racked with pain. A young student nurse heard my sobbing and came over to me. She took the covers off my face and started wiping my tears. She told me how lonely she was, having to work that day and not being able to be with her family. She asked me whether I would have dinner with her. She brought two trays of food, sliced turkey, mashed up potatoes, cranberry sauce and ice cream for dessert. She talked to me and tried to calm my fears. Even though she was scheduled to go off duty at 4 p.m., she stayed on her own time until almost 11 p.m. She played games with me, talked to me, and stayed with me until I finally fell asleep. Many Thanksgivings have come and gone since I was 10, but one never passes without me remembering that particular one and my feelings of frustration, fear, loneliness and the warmth and tenderness of the stranger that somehow made it all bearable. If you want others to like you, if you want to develop real friendships, if you want to help others at the same time as you help yourself, keep this principle in mind, principle one become genuinely interested in other people. Two a simple way to make a good first impression. At a dinner party in New York, one of the guests, a woman who had inherited money, was eager to make a pleasing impression on everyone. She had squandered a modest fortune on sables, diamonds and pearls. But she hadn't done anything whatever about her face. It radiated sourness and selfishness. She didn't realize what everyone knows, namely, that the expression one wears on one's face is far more important than the clothes one wears on one's back. Charles Schwab told me his smile had been worth a million dollars. And he was probably understating the truth. 4. Schwab's personality, his charm, his ability to make people like him, were almost wholly responsible for his extraordinary success. And one of the most delightful factors in his personality was his captivating smile. Actions speak louder than words, and a smile says, I like you, you make me happy. I am glad to see you. That is why dogs make such a hit. They are so glad to see us.
that they almost jump out of their skins. So, naturally, we are glad to see them. A baby smile has the same effect. Have you ever been in a doctor's waiting room and looked around at all the glum faces waiting impatiently to be seen? Dr. Stephen K. Sproul, a veterinarian in Raytown, Missouri, told of a typical spring day when his waiting room was full of clients waiting to have their pets inoculated. No one was talking to anyone else, and all were probably thinking of a dozen other things they would rather be doing than wasting time sitting in that office. He told one of our classes, there were six or seven clients waiting, when a young woman came in with a nine-month-old baby and a kitten. As luck would have it, she sat down next to a gentleman who was more than a little distraught about the long wait for service. The next thing he knew, the baby just looked up at him with that great big smile that is so characteristic of babies. What did that gentleman do? Just what you and I would do, of course, he smiled back at the baby. Soon he struck up a conversation with a woman about her baby and his grandchildren, and soon the entire reception room joined in, and the boredom and tension were converted into a pleasant and enjoyable experience. An insincere grin? No. That doesn't fool anybody. We know it is mechanical, and we resent it. I am talking about a real smile, a heartwarming smile, a smile that comes from within, the kind of smile that will bring a good price in the marketplace. Professor James B. McConnell, a psychologist at the University of Michigan, expressed his feelings about a smile. People who smile, he said, tend to manage teach and sell more effectively and to raise happier children. There's far more information in a smile than a frown. That's why encouragement is a much more effective teaching device than punishment. The employment manager of a large New York department store told me she would rather hire a sales clerk who hadn't finished grade school, if he or she has a pleasant smile, than to hire a doctor of philosophy with a somber face. The effect of a smile is powerful even when it is unseen. Telephone companies throughout the United States have a program called Phone Power which is offered to employees who use the telephone for selling their services or products. In this program they suggest that you smile when talking on the phone. Your smile comes through in your voice. Robert Cryer, manager of a computer department for a Cincinnati, Ohio, company, told how he had successfully found the right applicant for a hard-to-fill position. I was desperately trying to recruit a PhD in computer science for my department. I finally located a young man with ideal qualifications who was about to be graduated from Purdue University. After several phone conversations I learned that he had several offers from other companies, many of them larger and better known than mine. I was delighted when he accepted my offer. After he started on the job, I asked him why he had chosen us over the others. He paused for a moment, and then he said, I think it was because managers in the other companies spoke on the phone in a cold, business-like manner, which made me feel like just another business transaction, your voice sounded as if you were glad to hear from me, that you really wanted me to be part of your organization. You can be assured, I am still answering my phone with a smile. The chairman of the board of directors of one of the largest rubber companies in the United States told me that, according to his observations, people rarely succeed at anything unless they have fun doing it. This industrial leader doesn't put much faith in the old adage that hard work alone is the magic key that will unlock the door to our desires. I have known people, he said, who succeeded because they had a rip-roaring good time conducting their business. Later, I saw those people change as the fun became work. The business had grown dull, they lost all joy in it, and they failed. You must have a good time meeting people, if you expect them to have a good time meeting you. I have asked thousands of business people to smile at someone every hour of the day for a week and then come to class and talk about the results. How did it work? Let's see, here is a letter from William B. Steinhardt, a New York stockbroker. His case isn't isolated. In fact, it is typical of hundreds of cases. One had been married for over 18 years, wrote Mr. Steinhardt, and in all that time I seldom smiled at my wife or spoke two dozen words to her from the time I got up until I was ready to leave for business. I was one of the worst grouches who ever walked down Broadway. When you asked me to make a talk about my experience with smiles, I thought I would try it for a week. So the next morning, 
while combing my hair, I looked at my glum mug in the mirror and said to myself, Bill, you are going to wipe the scowl off that sour puss of yours today. You are going to smile. And you are going to begin right now. As I sat down to breakfast, I greeted my wife with a good morning, my dear, and smiled as I said it. You warned me that she might be surprised. Well, you underestimated her reaction. She was bewildered. She was shocked. I told her that in the future she could expect this as a regular occurrence, and I kept it up every morning. This changed attitude of mine brought more happiness into our home in the two months since I started than there was during the last year. As I leave for my office, I greet the elevator operator in the apartment house with a good morning and a smile, I greet the doorman with a smile. I smile at the cashier in the subway booth when I ask for change. As I stand on the floor of the stock exchange, I smile at people who until recently never saw me smile. I soon found that everybody was smiling back at me, I treat those who come to me with complaints or grievances in a cheerful manner, I smile as I listen to them, and I find that adjustments are accomplished much easier. I find that smiles are bringing me dollars, many dollars every day. I share my office with another broker. One of his clerks is a likable young chap, and I was so elated about the results I was getting that I told him recently about my new philosophy of human relations. He then confessed that, when I first came to share my office with his firm he bought me a terrible grouch and only recently changed his mind. He said I was really human when I smiled. I have also eliminated criticism from my system. I give appreciation and praise now instead of condemnation. I have stopped talking about what I want. I am now trying to see the other person's viewpoint. And these things have literally revolutionized my life. I am a totally different man, a happier man, a richer man, richer in friendships and happiness the only things that matter much after all. You don't feel like smiling? Then what? Two things. First, force yourself to smile. If you are alone, force yourself to whistle or hum a tune or sing. Act as if you are already happy, and that will tend to make you happy. Here's the way the psychologist and philosopher William James put it, action seems to follow feeling, but really action and feeling go together. And by regulating the action, which is under the more direct control of the will, we can indirectly regulate the feeling, which is not. Thus the sovereign voluntary path to cheerfulness, if our cheerfulness be lost, is to sit up cheerfully, and to act and speak, as if cheerfulness were already there, every body in the world, is seeking happiness and there is one sure way to find it. That is by controlling your thoughts. Happiness doesn't depend on outward conditions. It depends on inner conditions. It isn't what you have, or who you are, or where you are, or what you are doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It is what you think about it. For example, two people may be in the same place, doing the same thing, both may have about an equal amount of money and prestige, and yet one may be miserable, and the other happy. Why? Because of a different mental attitude. I have seen just as many happy faces among the poor peasants toiling with their primitive tools in the devastating heat of the tropics as I have seen in air-conditioned offices in New York, Chicago or Los Angeles. There is nothing either good or bad, said Shakespeare, but thinking makes it so. Abe Lincoln once remarked that most folks are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. He was right. I saw a vivid illustration of that truth as I was walking up the stairs of the Long Island Railroad Station in New York. Directly in front of me 30 or 40 crippled boys on canes and crutches were struggling up the stairs. One boy had to be carried up. I was astonished at their laughter and gaiety. I spoke about it to one of the men in charge of the boys. Oh, yes, he said, when a boy realizes that he's going to be a cripple for life, he is shocked at first. But after he gets over the shock, he usually resigns himself to his fate and then becomes as happy as normal boys. I felt like taking my hat off to those boys. They taught me a lesson I hope I shall never forget. Working all by oneself in a closed off room in an office not only is lonely, but it denies one the opportunity of making friends with other employees in the company. Sior Maria Gonzalez of Guadalajara, Mexico, had such a job. She envied the shared comradeship of other people in the company as she heard their chatter and laughter. 
As she passed them in the hall during the first weeks of her employment, she shyly looked the other way. After a few weeks, she said to herself, Maria, you can't expect those women to come to you. You have to go out and meet them. The next time she walked to the water cooler, she put on her brightest smile and said, Hi, how are you today to each of the people she met? The effect was immediate. Smiles and hellos were returned, the hallway seemed brighter, the job friendlier. Acquaintanceships developed and some ripened into friendships. Her job and her life became more pleasant and interesting. Peruse this bit of sage advice from the essayist and publisher Albert Hubbard but remember, perusing it won't do you any good unless you apply it whenever you go out of doors, draw the chin in, carry the crown of the head high and fill the lungs to the utmost, drink in the sunshine, greet your friends with a smile and put soul into every handclasp. Do not fear being misunderstood and do not waste a minute thinking about your enemies. Try to fix firmly in your mind what you would like to do, and then, without veering off direction, you will move straight to the goal. Keep your mind on the great and splendid things you would like to do, and then, as the days go gliding away, you will find yourself unconsciously seizing upon the opportunities that are required for the fulfillment of your desire, just as the coral insect takes from the running tide the element it needs. Picture in your mind the able, earnest, useful person you desire to be, and the thought you hold is hourly transforming you into that particular individual. Thought is supreme. Preserve a right mental attitude the attitude of courage, frankness, and good cheer. To think rightly is to create. All things come through desire and every sincere prayer is answered. We become like that on which our hearts are fixed. Carry your chin in and the crown of your head high. We are gods in the chrysalis. The ancient Chinese were a wise lot wise in the ways of the world, and they had a proverb that you and I ought to cut out and paste inside our hats. It goes like this, a man without a smiling face must not open a shop. Your smile is a messenger of your goodwill. Your smile brightens the lives of all who see it. To someone who has seen a dozen people frown, scowl or turn their faces away, your smile is like the sun breaking through the clouds. Especially when that someone is under pressure from his bosses, his customers, his teachers or parents or children, a smile can help him realize that all is not hopeless, that there is joy in the world. Some years ago, a department store in New York City, in recognition of the pressures its sales clerks were under during the Christmas rush, presented the readers of its advertisements with the following homely philosophy, the value of a smile at Christmas it costs nothing, but creates much. It enriches those who receive, without impoverishing those who give. It happens in a flash and the memory of it sometimes lasts forever, none are so rich they can get along without it, and none so poor, but are richer for its benefits. It creates happiness in the home, fosters goodwill in a business, and is the countersign of friends. It is rest to the weary, daylight to the discouraged, sunshine to the sad, and nature's best antidote feed trouble. Yet it cannot be bought, begged, borrowed, or stolen, for it is something that is no earthly good to anybody till it is given away. And if in the last-minute rush of Christmas buying some of our salespeople should be too tired to give you a smile, may we ask you to leave one of yours? For nobody needs a smile, so much as those who have none left to give. Principle 2 Smile. Three of you don't do this, you are headed for trouble. Back in 1898, a tragic thing happened in Rockland County, New York. A child had died, and on this particular day the neighbors were preparing to go to the funeral. Jim Farley went out to the barn to hitch up his horse. The ground was covered with snow, the air was cold and snappy, the horse hadn't been exercised for days, and as he was led out to the watering trough, he wheeled playfully, kicked both his heels high in the air, and killed Jim Farley. So the little village of Stony Point had two funerals that week instead of one. Jim Farley left behind him a widow and three boys and a few hundred dollars in insurance. His oldest boy, Jim, was 10, and he went to work in a brickyard, wheeling sand and pouring it into the molds and turning the brick on edge to be dried by the sun. This boy Jim never had a chance to get much education. But with his natural geniality, he had a flair for making people like him, so he went into politics, and as the years went by, he developed an uncanny ability for remembering people's names. 
He never saw the inside of a high school, but before he was 46 years of age, four colleges had honored him with degrees and he had become chairman of the Democratic National Committee and Postmaster General of the United States. I once interviewed Jim Farley and asked him the secret of his success. He said, hard work, and I said, don't be funny. He then asked me what I thought was the reason for his success. I replied, I understand you can call 10,000 people by their first names. No. You are wrong, he said. I can call 50,000 people by their first names. Make no mistake about it. That ability helped Mr. Farley put Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House when he managed Roosevelt's campaign in 1932. During the years that Jim Farley traveled as a salesman for a gypsum concern, and during the years that he held office as town clerk in Stony Point, he built up a system for remembering names. In the beginning, it was a very simple one. Whenever he met a new acquaintance, he found out his or her complete name and some facts about his or her family, business and political opinions. He fixed all these facts well in mind as part of the picture, and the next time he met that person, even if it was a year later, he was able to shake hands, inquire after the family, and ask about the hollyhocks in the backyard. No wonder he developed a following. For months before Roosevelt's campaign for president began, Jim Farley wrote hundreds of letters a day to people all over the western and northwestern states. Then he hopped onto a train and in 19 days covered 20 states and 12,000 miles, traveling by buggy, train, automobile and boat. He would drop into town, meet his people at lunch or breakfast, tea or dinner, and give them a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Then he'd dash off again on another leg of his journey. As soon as he arrived back east, he wrote to one person in each town he had visited, asking for a list of all the guests to whom he had talked. The final list contained thousands and thousands of names, yet each person on that list was paid the subtle flattery of getting a personal letter from James Farley. These letters began Dear Bill or Dear Jane, and they were always signed Jim. Jim Farley discovered early in life that the average person is more interested in his or her own name than in all the other names on earth put together. Remember that name and call it easily and you have paid a subtle and very effective compliment. But forget it or misspell it and you have placed yourself at a sharp disadvantage. For example, I once organized a public speaking course in Paris and sent form letters to all the American residents in the city. French typists with apparently little knowledge of English filled in the names and naturally they made blunders. One man, the manager of a large American bank in Paris, wrote me a scathing rebuke because his name had been misspelled. Sometimes it is difficult to remember a name, particularly if it is hard to pronounce. Rather than even try to learn it, many people ignore it or call the person by an easy nickname. Sid Levy called on a customer for some time whose name was Nicodemus Papadalos. Most people just called him Nick. Levy told us, I made a special effort to say his name over several times to myself before I made my call. When I greeted him by his full name, good afternoon, Mr. Nicodemus Papadalos, he was shocked. For what seemed like several minutes there was no reply from him at all. Finally, he said with tears rolling down his cheeks, Mr. Levy, in all the 15 years I have been in this country, nobody has ever made the effort to call me by my right name. What was the reason for Andrew Carnegie's success? He was called the Steel King, yet he himself knew little about the manufacture of steel. He had hundreds of people working for him who knew far more about steel than he did. But he knew how to handle people, and that is what made him rich. Early in life, he showed a flair for organization, a genius for leadership. By the time he was 10, he too had discovered the astounding importance people place on their own name. And he used that discovery to win cooperation. To illustrate, when he was a boy back in Scotland, he got hold of a rabbit, a mother rabbit. Presto! He soon had a whole nest of little rabbits and nothing to feed them. But he had a brilliant idea. He told the boys and girls in the neighborhood that if they would go out and pull enough clover and dandelions to feed the rabbits, he would name the bunnies in their honor. The plan worked like magic, and Carnegie never forgot it. Years later, he made millions by using the same psychology in business. For example, he wanted to sell steel rails to the Pennsylvania Railroad. 
J. Edgar Thompson was the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad then. So Andrew Carnegie built a huge steel mill in Pittsburgh and called it the Edgar Thompson Steel Works. Here is a riddle. See if you can guess it. When the Pennsylvania Railroad needed steel rails, where do you suppose J. Edgar Thompson bought them? From Sears, Roebuck? No. No. You're wrong. Guess again. When Carnegie and George Pullman were battling each other for supremacy in the railroad sleeping car business, the Steel King again remembered the lesson of the rabbits. The Central Transportation Company, which Andrew Carnegie controlled, was fighting with a company that Pullman owned. Both were struggling to get the sleeping car business of the Union Pacific Railroad, bucking each other, slashing prices, and destroying all chance of profit. Both Carnegie and Pullman had gone to New York to see the board of directors of the Union Pacific. Meeting one evening in the St. Nicholas Hotel, Carnegie said, Good evening, Mr. Pullman, aren't we making a couple of fools of ourselves? What do you mean? Pullman demanded. Then Carnegie expressed what he had on his mind a merger of their two interests. He pictured in glowing terms the mutual advantages of working with, instead of against, each other. Pullman listened attentively, but he was not wholly convinced. Finally he asked, what would you call the new company, and Carnegie replied promptly, why, the Pullman Palace Car Company, of course. Pullman's face brightened. Come into my room, he said. Let's talk it over. That talk made industrial history. This policy of remembering and honoring the names of his friends and business associates was one of the secrets of Andrew Carnegie's leadership. He was proud of the fact that he could call many of his factory workers by their first names, and he boasted that, while he was personally in charge, no strike ever disturbed his flaming steel mills. Benton Love, chairman of Texas Commerce Bank Shares, believes that the bigger a corporation gets, the colder it becomes. One way to warm it up, he said, is to remember people's names. The executive who tells me he can't remember names is at the same time telling me he can't remember a significant part of his business and is operating on quicksand. Karen Kersich of Rancho Palos Verdes, California, a flight attendant for TWA, made it a practice to learn the names of as many passengers in her cabin as possible and use the name when serving them. This resulted in many compliments on her service expressed both to her directly and to the airline. One passenger wrote, I haven't flown TWA for some time, but I'm going to start flying nothing but TWA from now on. You make me feel that your airline has become a very personalized airline, and that is important to me. People are so proud of their names that they strive to perpetuate them at any cost. Even blustering, hard-boiled old P.T. Barnum, the greatest showman of his time, disappointed because he had no sons to carry on his name offered his grandson, C.H. Seeley, $25,000, if he would call himself Barnum Seeley. For many centuries, nobles and magnates supported artists, musicians, and authors so that their creative works would be dedicated to them. Libraries and museums owe their richest collections to people who cannot bear to think that their names might perish from the memory of the race. The New York Public Library has its Astor and Lennox collections. The Metropolitan Museum perpetuates the names of Benjamin Altman and J.P. Morgan. And nearly every church is beautified by stained glass windows commemorating the names of their donors. Many of the buildings on the campus of most universities bear the names of donors who contributed large sums of money for this honor. Most people don't remember names for the simple reason that they don't take the time and energy necessary to concentrate and repeat and fix names indelibly in their minds they make excuses for themselves, they are too busy. But they were probably no busier than Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he took time to remember and recall even the names of mechanics with whom he came into contact. To illustrate, the Chrysler organization built a special car for Mr. Roosevelt, who could not use a standard car because his legs were paralyzed. W.F. Chamberlain and a mechanic delivered it to the White House, I have in front of me a letter from Mr. Chamberlain relating his experiences. I taught President Roosevelt how to handle a car with a lot of unusual gadgets, but he taught me a lot about the fine art of handling people. When I called at the White House, Mr. Chamberlain writes, the president was extremely pleasant and cheerful. 
he called me by name, made me feel very comfortable, and particularly impressed me with the fact that he was vitally interested in things I had to show him and tell him. The car was so designed that it could be operated entirely by hand. A crowd gathered around to look at the car, and he remarked, I think it is marvelous. All you have to do is to touch a button, and it moves away, and you can drive it without effort. I think it is grand I don't know what makes it go. I'd love to have the time to tear it down and see how it works. When Roosevelt's friends and associates admired the machine, he said in their presence, Mr. Chamberlain, I certainly appreciate all the time and effort you have spent in developing this car. It is a mighty fine job. He admired the radiator, the special rear vision mirror and clock, the special spotlight, the kind of upholstery, the sitting position of the driver's seat, the special suitcases in the trunk with his monogram on each suitcase. In other words, he took notice of every detail to which he knew I had given considerable thought. He made a point of bringing these various pieces of equipment to the attention of Mrs. Roosevelt, Miss Perkins, the Secretary of Labor, and his secretary. He even brought the old White House porter into the picture by saying, George, do you want to take particularly good care of the suitcases? When the driving lesson was finished, the president turned to me and said, well, Mr. Chamberlain, I have been keeping the Federal Reserve Board waiting 30 minutes. I guess I had better get back to work. I took a mechanic with me to the White House. He was introduced to Roosevelt when he arrived. He didn't talk to the president, and Roosevelt heard his name only once. He was a shy chap, and he kept in the background. But before leaving us, the president looked for the mechanic, shook his hand, called him by name, and thanked him for coming to Washington. And there was nothing perfunctory about his thanks. He meant what he said. I could feel that. A few days, after returning to New York, I got an autographed photograph of President Roosevelt and a little note of thanks again expressing his appreciation for my assistance. How he found time to do it is a mystery to me. Franklin D. Roosevelt knew that one of the simplest, most obvious and most important ways of gaining goodwill was by remembering names and making people feel important, yet how many of us do it? Half the time we are introduced to a stranger, we chat a few minutes, and can't even remember his or her name by the time we say goodbye. One of the first lessons a politician learns is this, to recall a voter's name is statesmanship. To forget it is oblivion. And the ability to remember names is almost as important in business and social contacts as it is in politics. Napoleon III, Emperor of France and nephew of the great Napoleon, boasted that in spite of all his royal duties he could remember the name of every person he met. His technique? Simple. If he didn't hear the name distinctly, he said, so sorry. I didn't get the name clearly. Then, if it was an unusual name, he would say, how is it spelled? During the conversation, he took the trouble to repeat the name several times and tried to associate it in his mind with the person's features, expression and general appearance. If the person was someone of importance, Napoleon went to even further pains. As soon as His Royal Highness was alone, he wrote the name down on a piece of paper, looked at it, concentrated on it, fixed it securely in his mind, and then tore up the paper. In this way, he gained an eye impression of the name as well as an ear impression. All this takes time, but good manners, said Emerson, are made up of petty sacrifices. The importance of remembering and using names is not just the prerogative of kings and corporate executives. It works for all of us. Ken Nottingham, an employee of General Motors in Indiana, usually had lunch at the company cafeteria. He noticed that the woman who worked behind the counter always had a scowl on her face. She had been making sandwiches for about two hours, and I was just another sandwich to her. I told her what I wanted. She weighed out the ham on a little scale, then she gave me one leaf of lettuce, a few potato chips, and handed them to me. The next day I went through the same line. Same woman, same scowl. The only difference was I noticed her name tag. I smiled and said, hello, Eunice, and then told her what I wanted. Well. She forgot the scale, piled on the ham, gave me three leaves of lettuce, and heaped on the potato chips until they fell off the plate. We should be aware of the magic contained in a name, 
and realize that this single item is wholly and completely owned by the person with whom we are dealing and nobody else. The name sets the individual apart, it makes him or her unique among all others. The information we are imparting, or the request we are making takes on a special importance when we approach the situation with the name of the individual. From the waitress to the senior executive, the name will work magic as we deal with others. Principle 3 Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. 4. An easy way to become a good conversationalist. Some time ago, I attended a bridge party. I don't play bridge and there was a woman there who didn't play bridge either. She had discovered that I had once been Lowell Thomas's manager before he went on the radio and that I had traveled in Europe a great deal while helping him prepare the illustrated travel talks he was then delivering. So she said, oh, Mr. Carnegie, I do want you to tell me about all the wonderful places you have visited and the sights you have seen. As we sat down on the sofa, she remarked that she and her husband had recently returned from a trip to Africa. Africa. I exclaimed. How interesting. I've always wanted to see Africa, but I never got there, except for a 24-hour stay once in Algiers. Tell me, did you visit the big game country? Yes. How fortunate. I envy you. Do tell me about Africa. That kept her talking for 45 minutes. She never again asked me where I had been or what I had seen. She didn't want to hear me talk about my travels. All she wanted was an interested listener so she could expand her ego and tell about where she had been. Was he unusual? No. Many people are like that. For example, I met a distinguished botanist at a dinner party given by a New York book publisher. I had never talked with a botanist before and I found him fascinating. I literally sat on the edge of my chair and listened while he spoke of exotic plants and experiments in developing new forms of plant life and indoor gardens and even told me astonishing facts about the humble potato. I had a small indoor garden of my own and he was good enough to tell me how to solve some of my problems. As I said, we were at a dinner party. There must have been a dozen other guests, but I violated all the canons of courtesy, ignored everyone else and talked for hours to the botanist. Midnight came, I said goodnight to everyone and departed. The botanist then turned to our host and paid me several flattering compliments. I was most stimulating. I was this and I was that, and he ended by saying I was a most interesting conversationalist. An interesting conversationalist? Why, I had said hardly anything at all. I couldn't have said anything if I had wanted to without changing the subject for I didn't know any more about botany than I knew about the anatomy of a penguin. But I had done this. I had listened intently. I had listened because I was genuinely interested. And he felt it. Naturally that pleased him. That kind of listening is one of the highest compliments we can pay anyone. Few human beings, wrote Jack Woodford in Strangers in Love, few human beings are proof against the implied flattery of rapt attention. I went even further than giving him rapt attention. I was hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. I told him that I had been immensely entertained and instructed and I had. I told him I wished I had his knowledge and I did. I told him that I should love to wander the fields with him and I have. I told him I must see him again and I did. And so I had him thinking of me as a good conversationalist when, in reality, I had been merely a good listener and had encouraged him to talk. What is the secret, the mystery, of a successful business interview? Well, according to former Harvard President Charles W. Eliot, there is no mystery about successful business intercourse. Exclusive attention to the person who is speaking to you is very important. Nothing else is so flattering as that. Eliot himself was a past master of the art of listening, Henry James, one of America's first great novelists. Recalled, Dr. Eliot's listening was not mere silence, but a form of activity. Sitting very erect on the end of his spine with hands joined in his lap, making no movement, except that he revolved his thumbs around each other faster or slower, he faced his interlocutor and seemed to be hearing with his eyes as well as his ears. He listened with his mind and attentively considered what you had to say while you said it. At the end of an interview the person who had talked to him felt that he had had his say. 
self-evident, isn't it? You don't have to study for four years in Harvard to discover that. Yet I know, and you know department store owners who will rent expensive space, buy their goods economically, dress their windows appealingly, spend thousands of dollars in advertising, and then hire clerks who haven't the sense to be good listeners clerks who interrupt customers, contradict them, irritate them, and all but drive them from the store. A department store in Chicago almost lost a regular customer who spent several thousand dollars each year in that store because a sales clerk wouldn't listen. Mrs. Henrietta Douglas, who took her course in Chicago, had purchased a coat at a special sale. After she had brought it home she noticed that there was a tear in the lining. She came back the next day and asked the sales clerk to exchange it. The clerk refused even to listen to her complaint. You bought this at a special sale, she said. She pointed to a sign on the wall. Read that, she exclaimed. All sales are final. Once you bought it, you have to keep it. Sew up the lining yourself. But this was damaged merchandise, Mrs. Douglas complained. Makes no difference, the clerk interrupted. Finals final misses. Douglas was about to walk out indignantly, swearing never to return to that store ever when she was greeted by the department manager, who knew her from her many years of patronage. Mrs. Douglas told her what had happened. The manager listened attentively to the whole story, examined the code and then said, special sales are final, so we can dispose of merchandise at the end of the season. But this no return policy does not apply to damaged goods. We will certainly repair or replace the lining, or if you prefer, give you your money back. What a difference in treatment. If that manager had not come along and listened to the customer, a long-term patron of that store could have been lost forever. Listening is just as important in one's home life as in the world of business. Millie Esposito of Croton on Hudson, New York, made it her business to listen carefully when one of her children wanted to speak with her. One evening she was sitting in the kitchen with her son, Robert, and after a brief discussion of something that was on his mind, Robert said, Mom, I know that you love me very much. Mrs. Esposito was touched and said, of course I love you very much. Do you doubt it? Robert responded, no, but I really know you love me, because whenever I want to talk to you about something you stop whatever you are doing and listen to me. The chronic kicker, even the most violent critic, will frequently soften and be subdued in the presence of a patient sympathetic listener a listener who will he silent while the irate fault finder dilates like a king cobra and spews the poison out of his system. To illustrate, the New York Telephone Company discovered a few years ago that it had to deal with one of the most vicious customers who ever cursed a customer service representative. And he did curse. He raved. He threatened to tear the phone out by its roots. He refused to pay certain charges that he declared were false. He wrote letters to the newspapers. He filed innumerable complaints with the Public Service Commission, and he started several suits against the telephone company. At last, one of the company's most skillful troubleshooters was sent to interview this stormy petrol. This troubleshooter listened and let the cantankerous customer enjoy himself pouring out his tirade. The telephone representative listened and said yes and sympathized with his grievance. He raved on and I listened for nearly three hours," the troubleshooter said as he related his experiences before one of the author's classes. Then I went back and listened some more. I interviewed him four times, and before the fourth visit was over I had become a charter member of an organization he was starting. He called it the Telephone Subscribers Protective Association. I am still a member of this organization, and, so far as I know, I'm the only member in the world today besides Mr. Dot. I listened and sympathized with him on every point that he made during these interviews. He had never had a telephone representative talk with him that way before, and he became almost friendly. The point on which I went to see him was not even mentioned on the first visit, nor was it mentioned on the second or third, but upon the fourth interview, I closed the case completely, he paid all his bills in full and for the first time in the history of his difficulties with the telephone company he voluntarily withdrew his complaints from the Public Service Commission. Doubtless Mr. He considered himself a holy crusader, defending the public rights against callous exploitation. But in reality, what he had really wanted 
was a feeling of importance. He got this feeling of importance at first by kicking and complaining. But as soon as he got his feeling of importance from a representative of the company, his imagined grievances vanished into thin air. One morning years ago, an angry customer stormed into the office of Julian F. Detmer, founder of the Detmer Woolen Company, which later became the world's largest distributor of woolens to the tailoring trade. This man owed us a small sum of money, Mr. Detmer explained to me. The customer denied it, but we knew he was wrong. So our credit department had insisted that he pay. After getting a number of letters from our credit department, he packed his grip, made a trip to Chicago, and hurried into my office to inform me, not only that he was not going to pay that bill, but that he was never going to buy another dollar's worth of goods from the Detmer Woolen Company. I listened patiently to all he had to say. I was tempted to interrupt, but I realized that would be bad policy, so I let him talk himself out. When he finally simmered down and got in a receptive mood, I said quietly, I want to thank Vu for coming to Chicago to tell me about this. You have done me a great favor, for if our credit department has annoyed you, it may annoy other good customers, and that would be just too bad. Believe me, I am far more eager to hear this than you are to tell it. That was the last thing in the world he expected me to say. I think he was a trifle disappointed because he had come to Chicago to tell me a thing or two, but here I was thanking him instead of scrapping with him. I assured him we would wipe the charge off the books and forget it, because he was a very careful man with only one account to look after, while our clerks had to look after thousands. Therefore, he was less likely to be wrong than we were. I told him that I understood exactly how he felt and that, if I were in his shoes, I should undoubtedly feel precisely as he did. Since he wasn't going to buy from us, anymore, I recommended some other woolen houses. In the past, we had usually lunch together when he came to Chicago, so I invited him to have lunch with me this day. He accepted reluctantly, but when we came back to the office he placed a larger order than ever before. He returned home in a softened mood and, wanting to be just as fair with us as we had been with him, looked over his bills, found one that had been mislaid, and sent us a check with his apologies. Later, when his wife presented him with a baby boy, he gave his son the middle name of Detmer, and he remained a friend and customer of the house until his death 22 years afterwards. Years ago, a poor Dutch immigrant boy washed the windows of a bakery shop after school to help support his family. His people were so poor that in addition he used to go out in the street with a basket every day and collect stray bits of coal that had fallen in the gutter where the coal wagons had delivered fuel. That boy, Edward Bach, never got more than six years of schooling in his life, yet eventually he made himself one of the most successful magazine editors in the history of American journalism. How did he do it? That is a long story, but how he got his start can be told briefly. He got his start by using the principles advocated in this chapter. He left school when he was 13 and became an office boy for Western Union, but he didn't for one moment give up the idea of an education. Instead, he started to educate himself, he saved his car fares, and went without lunch until he had enough money to buy an encyclopedia of American biography, and then he did an unheard of thing. He read the lives of famous people and wrote them asking for additional information about their childhoods. He was a good listener. He asked famous people to tell him more about themselves. He wrote General James A. Garfield, who was then running for president, and asked if it was true that he was once a towboy on a canal, and Garfield replied. He wrote General Grant asking about a certain battle, and Grant drew a map for him, and invited this 14-year-old boy to dinner and spent the evening talking to him. Soon our Western Union messenger boy was corresponding with many of the most famous people in the nation, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Longfellow, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, Louisa May Alcott, General Sherman and Jefferson Davis. Not only did he correspond with these distinguished people, but as soon as he got a vacation, he visited many of them as a welcome guest in their homes. This experience imbued him with a confidence that was invaluable. These men and women fired him with a vision and ambition that shaped his life. And all this, let me repeat, was made possible solely by the application of the principles we are discussing here. Isaac F. Marcassen, 
a journalist who interviewed hundreds of celebrities, declared that many people fail to make a favorable impression because they don't listen attentively. They have been so much concerned with what they are going to say next that they do not keep their ears open, very important people have told me that they prefer good listeners to good talkers, but the ability to listen seems rarer than almost any other good trait. And not only important personages crave a good listener, but ordinary folk do too. As the Reader's Digest once said, many persons call a doctor when all they want is an audience, during the darkest hours of the Civil War, Lincoln wrote. To an old friend in Springfield, Illinois, asking him to come to Washington. Lincoln said he had some problems he wanted to discuss with him. The old neighbor called at the White House, and Lincoln talked to him for hours about the advisability of issuing a proclamation freeing the slaves. Lincoln went over all the arguments for and against such a move, and then read letters and newspaper articles, some denouncing him for not freeing the slaves and others denouncing him for fear he was going to free them. After talking for hours, Lincoln shook hands with his old neighbor, said good night, and sent him back to Illinois without even asking for his opinion. Lincoln had done all the talking himself. That seemed to clarify his mind. He seemed to feel easier after that talk, the old friend said. Lincoln hadn't wanted advice, he had wanted merely a friendly sympathetic listener to whom he could unburden himself. That's what we all want, when we are in trouble. That is frequently all the irritated customer wants, and the dissatisfied employer the hurt friend. One of the great listeners of modern times was Sigmund Freud. A man who met Freud described his manner of listening, it struck me so forcibly, that I shall never forget him. He had qualities which I had never seen in any other man. Never had I seen such concentrated attention. There was none of that piercing soul-penetrating gaze business. His eyes were mild and genial. His voice was low and kind. His gestures were few. But the attention he gave me, his appreciation of what I said, even when I said it badly, was extraordinary, you've no idea what it meant to be listened to like that. If you want to know how to make people shun you and laugh at you behind your back and even despise you, here is the recipe, never listen to anyone for long. Talk incessantly about yourself. If you have an idea, while the other person is talking, don't wait for him or her to finish, bust right in and interrupt in the middle of a sentence. Do you know people like that? I do, unfortunately. And the astonishing part of it is that some of them are prominent. Bores that is all they are bores intoxicated with their own egos, drunk with a sense of their own importance. People who talk only of themselves think only of themselves. And those people who think only of themselves, Dr. Nicholas Murray Butler, longtime president of Columbia University, said, are hopelessly uneducated. They are not educated, said Dr. Butler, no matter how instructed they may be. So if you aspire to be a good conversationalist, be an attentive listener, to be interesting, be interested. Ask questions that other persons will enjoy answering. Encourage them to talk about themselves and their accomplishments. Remember that the people you are talking to are a hundred times more interested in themselves and their wants and problems than they are in you and your problems. A person's toothache means more to that person than a famine in China which kills a million people. A boil on one's neck interests one more than 40 earthquakes in Africa. Think of that the next time you start a conversation. Principle 4 Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. 5. How to interest people. Everyone who was ever a guest of Theodore Roosevelt was astonished at the range and diversity of his knowledge. Whether his visitor was a cowboy or a rough rider, a New York politician or a diplomat, Roosevelt knew what to say. And how was it done? The answer was simple. Whenever Roosevelt expected a visitor, he sat up late the night before, reading up on the subject in which he knew his guest was particularly interested. For Roosevelt knew, as all leaders know, that the royal road to a person's heart is to talk about the things he or she treasures most. The genial William Lyon Phelps, essayist and professor of literature at Yale, learned this lesson early in life. When I was eight years old, and was spending a weekend visiting my Aunt Libby Lindsley at her home in Stratford on the House of Tonic, he wrote in his essay on human nature, a middle-aged man called one evening, and after a polite skirmish with my aunt, he devoted his attention to me. At that time, 
I happened to be excited about boats, and the visitor discussed the subject in a way that seemed to me particularly interesting. After he left, I spoke of him with enthusiasm. What a man. My aunt informed me he was a New York lawyer, that he cared nothing whatever about boats, that he took not the slightest interest in the subject. But why then did he talk all the time about boats? Because he is a gentleman. He saw you were interested in boats, and he talked about the things he knew would interest and please you. He made himself agreeable. And William Lyon Phelps added, I never forgot my aunt's remark. As I write this chapter, I have before me a letter from Edward L. Chaliff, who was active in Boy Scout work. One day I found I needed a favor, wrote Mr. Chaliff. A big scout jamboree was coming off in Europe, and I wanted the president of one of the largest corporations in America to pay the expenses of one of my boys for the trip. Fortunately, just before I went to see this man, I heard that he had drawn a check for a million dollars, and that after it was cancelled, he had had it framed. So the first thing I did, when I entered his office was to ask to see the check. A check for a million dollars. I told him I never knew that anybody had ever written such a check, and that I wanted to tell my boys that I had actually seen a check for a million dollars. He gladly showed it to me, I admired it, and asked him to tell me all about how it happened to be drawn. You notice, don't you, that Mr. Chaliff didn't begin by talking about the Boy Scouts, or the Jamboree in Europe, or what it was he wanted. He talked in terms of what interested the other man. Here's the result, presently, the man I was interviewing said, oh, by the way, what was it you wanted to see me about? So I told him. To my vast surprise, Mr. Chaliff continues, he not only granted immediately what I asked for, but much more. I had asked him to send only one boy to Europe, but he sent five boys and myself, gave me a letter of credit for a thousand dollars, and told us to stay in Europe for seven weeks. He also gave me letters of introduction to his branch presidents, putting them at our service, and he himself met us in Paris, and showed us the town. Since then, he has given jobs to some of the boys whose parents were in want, and he is still active in our group. Yet I know, if I hadn't found out what he was interested in, and got him warmed up first, I wouldn't have found him one-tenth as easy to approach. Is this a valuable technique to use in business? Is it? Let's see, take Henry G. Duvernoy of Duvernoy & Sons, a wholesale baking firm in New York. Mr. Duvernoy had been trying to sell bread to a certain New York hotel. He had called on the manager every week for four years. He went to the same social affairs the manager attended. He even took rooms in the hotel and lived there in order to get the business. But he failed. Then, said Mr. Duvernoy, after studying human relations, I resolved to change my tactics. I decided to find out what interested this man what caught his enthusiasm. I discovered he belonged to a society of hotel executives called the Hotel Greeters of America. He not only belonged, but his bubbling enthusiasm had made him president of the organization and president of the international greeters. No matter where its conventions were held, he would be there. So when I saw him the next day, I began talking about the greeters. What a response I got. What a response. He talked to me for half an hour about the greeters, his tones vibrant with enthusiasm. I could plainly see that this society was not only his hobby, it was the passion of his life. Before I left his office, he had sold me a membership in his organization. In the meantime, I had said nothing about bread. But a few days later, the steward of his hotel phoned me to come over with samples and prices. I don't know what you did to the old boy, the steward greeted me, but he sure is sold on you. Think of it. I had been drumming at that man for four years trying to get his business and I'd still be drumming at him if I hadn't finally taken the trouble to find out what he was interested in and what he enjoyed talking about. Edward E. Harriman of Hagerstown, Maryland, chose to live in the beautiful Cumberland Valley of Maryland after he completed his military service. Unfortunately, at that time there were few jobs available in the area. A little research uncovered the fact that a number of companies in the area were either owned or controlled by an unusual business maverick, R.J. Funkhauser, whose rise from poverty to riches intrigued Mr. Harriman. However, he was known for being inaccessible to job seekers. 
Mr. Harriman wrote, I interviewed a number of people and found that his major interest was anchored in his drive for power and money. Since he protected himself from people like me by use of a dedicated and stern secretary, I studied her interests and goals, and only then I paid an unannounced visit at her office. She had been Mr. Funkhauser's orbiting satellite for about 15 years. When I told her I had a proposition for him which might translate itself into financial and political success for him, she became enthused. I also conversed with her about her constructive participation in his success. After this conversation she arranged for me to meet Mr. Funkhauser. I entered his huge and impressive office determined not to ask directly for a job. He was seated behind a large carved desk and thundered at me, how about it, young man? I said, Mr. Funkhauser, I believe I can make money for you. He immediately rose and invited me to sit in one of the large upholstered chairs. I enumerated my ideas and the qualifications I had to realize these ideas, as well as how they would contribute to his personal success in that of his businesses. RJ, as he became known to me, hired me at once, and for over 20 years I have grown in his enterprises, and we both have prospered. Talking in terms of the other person's interests pays off for both parties. Howard Z. Herzig, a leader in the field of employee communications, has always followed this principle. When asked what reward he got from it, Mr. Herzig responded that he not only received a different reward from each person but that in general the reward had been an enlargement of his life each time he spoke to someone. Principle 5 Talk in terms of the other person's interests. 6. How to make people like you instantly. I was waiting in line to register a letter in the post office at 33rd Street and 8th Avenue in New York. I noticed that the clerk appeared to be bored with the job weighing envelopes, handing out stamps, making change, issuing receipts the same monotonous grind year after year. So I said to myself, I am going to try to make that clerk like me. Obviously, to make him like me, I must say something nice, not about myself, but about him. So I asked myself, what is there about him that I can honestly admire? That is sometimes a hard question to answer, especially with strangers, but, in this case, it happened to be easy. I instantly saw something I admired no end. So while he was weighing my envelope, I remarked with enthusiasm, I certainly wish I had your head of hair. He looked up, half startled, his face beaming with smiles. Well, it isn't as good as it used to be, he said modestly. I assured him that, although it might have lost some of its pristine glory, nevertheless it was still magnificent. He was immensely pleased. We carried on a pleasant little conversation, and the last thing he said to me was, many people have admired my hair. I'll bet that person went out to lunch that day walking on air. I'll bet he went home that night and told his wife about it. I'll bet he looked in the mirror and said, it is a beautiful head of hair. I told this story once in public, and a man asked me afterwards, what did you want to get out of him? What was I trying to get out of him? What was I trying to get out of him? If we are so contemptibly selfish that we can't radiate a little happiness and pass on a bit of honest appreciation without trying to get something out of the other person in return, if our souls are no bigger than sour crab apples, we shall meet with the failure we so richly deserve. Oh yes, I did want something out of that chap. I wanted something priceless. And I got it. I got the feeling that I had done something for him without his being able to do anything, whatever in return for me. That is a feeling that flows and sings in your memory lung after the incident is past. There is one all-important law of human conduct. If we obey that law, we shall almost never get into trouble. In fact, that law, if obeyed, will bring us countless friends and constant happiness. But the very instant we break the law, we shall get into endless trouble. The law is this, always make the other person feel important. John Dewey, as we have already noted, said that the desire to be important is the deepest urge in human nature. And William James said, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. As I have already pointed out, it is this urge that differentiates us from the animals. It is this urge that has been responsible for civilization itself. 
philosophers have been speculating on the rules of human relationships for thousands of years, and out of all that speculation, there has evolved only one important precept. It is not new. It is as old as history. Zoroaster taught it to his followers in Persia 2,500 years ago. Confucius preached it in China 24 centuries ago. Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, taught it to his disciples in the Valley of the Han. Buddha preached it on the bank of the Holy Ganges 500 years before Christ. The sacred books of Hinduism taught it a thousand years before that. Jesus taught it among the stony hills of Judea 19 centuries ago. Jesus summed it up in one thought probably the most important rule in the world, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Do you want the approval of those with whom you come in contact? Do you want recognition of your true worth? Do you want a feeling that you are important in your little world? You don't want to listen to cheap, insincere flattery, but you do crave sincere appreciation. Do you want your friends and associates to be, as Charles Schwab put it, hearty in their approbation and lavish in their praise. All of us want that. So let's obey the golden rule and give unto others what we would have others give unto us, how, when, where. The answer is, all the time, everywhere. David G. Smith of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, told one of our classes how he handled a delicate situation when he was asked to take charge of the refreshment booth at a charity concert, the night of the concert I arrived at the park and found two elderly ladies in a very bad humor standing next to the refreshment stand. Apparently each thought that she was in charge of this project. As I stood there pondering what to do, me of the members of the sponsoring committee appeared and handed me a cash box and thanked me for taking over the project. She introduced Rose and Jane as my helpers, and then ran off. A great silence ensued. Realizing that the cash box was a symbol of authority, of sorts, I gave the box to Rose and explained that I might not be able to keep the money straight, and that if she took care of it, I would feel better. I then suggested to Jane that she show two teenagers who had been assigned to refreshments how to operate the soda machine, and I asked her to be responsible for that part of the project. The evening was very enjoyable with Rose happily counting the money, Jane supervising the teenagers, and me enjoying the concert. You don't have to wait until you are ambassador to France or chairman of the Clambic Committee of your lodge before you use this philosophy of appreciation. You can work magic with it almost every day. If, for example, the waitress brings us mashed potatoes, when we have ordered French fried, let's say, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I prefer French fried. She'll probably reply, no trouble at all, and will be glad to change the potatoes, because we have shown respect for her. Little phrases such as I'm sorry to trouble you, would you be so kind, as to won't you please? Would you? Mind? Thank you little courtesies like these oil the cogs of the monotonous grind of everyday life, and, incidentally, they are the hallmark of good breeding. Let's take another illustration. Hall Caine's novels The Christian, The Deemster, The Manxman, among them were all bestsellers in the early part of the century. Millions of people read his novels, countless millions. He was the son of a blacksmith. He never had more than eight years of schooling in his life, yet when he died he was the richest literary man of his time. The story goes like this, Hall Caine loved sonnets and ballads, so he devoured all of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's poetry. He even wrote a lecture chanting the praises of Rossetti's artistic achievement and sent a copy to Rossetti himself. Rossetti was delighted. Any young man who has such an exalted opinion of my ability, Rossetti probably said to himself, must be brilliant, so Rossetti invited this blacksmith's son to come to London and act as his secretary. That was the turning point in Hall Caine's life, for, in his new position, he met the literary artists of the day. Profiting by their advice and inspired by their encouragement, he launched upon a career that emblazoned his name across the sky. His home, Greba Castle, on the Isle of Man, became a mecca for tourists from the far corners of the world, and he left a multi-million dollar estate. Yet who knows he might have died poor and unknown had he not written an essay expressing his admiration for a famous man. Such is the power, the stupendous power, of sincere, heartfelt appreciation. Rossetti considered himself important. That is not strange, 
almost everyone considers himself important, very important. The life of many a person could probably be changed, if only someone would make him feel important. Ronald J. Rowland, who is one of the instructors of our course in California, is also a teacher of arts and crafts. He wrote to us about a student named Chris in his beginning crafts class, Chris was a very quiet, shy boy lacking in self-confidence, the kind of student that often does not receive the attention he deserves. I also teach an advanced class that had grown to be somewhat of a status symbol and a privilege for a student to have earned the right to be in it. On Wednesday, Chris was diligently working at his desk. I really felt there was a hidden fire deep inside him. I asked Chris if he would like to be in the advanced class. How I wish I could express the look in Chris's face, the emotions in that shy 14-year-old boy trying to hold back his tears. Who me, Mr. Roland? Am I good enough? Yes, Chris, you are good enough. I had to leave at that point because tears were coming to my eyes. As Chris walked out of class that day, seemingly two inches taller, he looked at me with bright blue eyes and said in a positive voice, thank you, Mr. Roland. Chris taught me a lesson I will never forget our deep desire to feel important. To help me never forget this rule, I made a sign which reads you are important. This sign hangs in the front of the classroom for all to see and to remind me that each student I face is equally important. The unvarnished truth is that almost all the people you meet feel themselves superior to you in some way, and a sure way to their hearts is to let them realize in some subtle way that you recognize their importance and recognize it sincerely. Remember what Emerson said, every man I meet is my superior in some way. In that, I learn of him. And the pathetic part of it is that frequently those who have the least justification for a feeling of achievement bolster up their egos by a show of tumult and conceit which is truly nauseating. As Shakespeare put it, man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep. I am going to tell you how business people in my own courses have applied these principles with remarkable results. Let's take the case of a Connecticut attorney, because of his relatives he prefers not to have his name mentioned. Shortly after joining the course, Mr. R drove to Long Island with his wife to visit some of her relatives. She left him to chat with an old aunt of hers, and her rushed off by herself to visit some of the younger relatives. Since he soon had to give a speech professionally on how he applied the principles of appreciation, he thought he would gain some worthwhile experience talking with the elderly lady. So he looked around the house to see what he could honestly admire. This house was built about 1890, wasn't it? He inquired. Yes, she replied, that is precisely the year it was built. It reminds me of the house I was born in, he said. It's beautiful. Well built. Roomy. You know, they don't build houses like this anymore. You're right, the old lady agreed. The young folks nowadays don't care for beautiful homes. All they want is a small apartment, and then they go off gadding about in their automobiles. This is a dream house, she said in a voice vibrating with tender memories. This house was built with love. My husband and I dreamed about it for years, before we built it. We didn't have an architect. We planned it all ourselves. She showed Mr. R about the house, and he expressed his hearty admiration for the beautiful treasures she had picked up in her travels and cherished over a lifetime paisley shawls, an old English tea set, Wedgwood china, French beds and chairs, Italian paintings, and silk draperies that had once hung in a French chateau. After showing Mr. R through the house, she took him out to the garage. There, jacked up on blocks, was a Packard car in mint condition. My husband bought that car for me shortly, before he passed on, she said softly. I have never ridden in it since his death, you appreciate nice things, and I'm going to give this car to you. Why, Auntie, he said, you overwhelm me. I appreciate your generosity, of course, but I couldn't possibly accept it. I'm not even a relative of yours. I have a new car, and you have many relatives that would like to have that Packard. Relatives, she exclaimed. Yes, I have relatives who are just waiting till I die so they can get that car. But they are not going to get it. If you don't want to give it to them, you can very easily sell it to a second-hand dealer, he told her. Sell it, she cried. 
Do you think I would sell this car? Do you think I could stand to see strangers riding up and down the street in that car, that car that my husband bought for? Me? I wouldn't dream of selling it. I'm going to give it to you. You appreciate beautiful things. He tried to get out of accepting the car, but he couldn't without hurting her feelings. This lady, left all alone in a big house with her paisley shawls, her French antiques, and her memories, was starving for a little recognition, she had once been young and beautiful and sought, after she had once built a house warm with love and had collected things from all over Europe to make it beautiful. Now, in the isolated loneliness of old age, she craved a little human warmth, a little genuine appreciation, and no one gave it to her. And when she found it, like a spring in the desert, her gratitude couldn't adequately express itself with anything less than the gift of her cherished Packard. Let's take another case, Donald M. McMahon, who was superintendent of Lewis and Valentine, nurseryman and landscape architects in Rye, New York, related this incident, shortly after I attended the talk on how to win friends and influence people, I was landscaping the estate of a famous attorney. The owner came out to give me a few instructions about where he wished to plant a mass of rhododendrons and azaleas. I said, Judge, you have a lovely hobby. I've been admiring your beautiful dogs. I understand you win a lot of blue ribbons every year at the show in Madison Square Garden. The effect of this little expression of appreciation was striking. Yes, the judge replied, I do have a lot of fun with my dogs. Would you like to see my kennel? He spent almost an hour showing me his dogs and the prizes they had won. He even brought out their pedigrees and explained about the bloodlines responsible for such beauty and intelligence. Finally, turning to me, he asked, do you have any small children? Yes, I do, I replied. I have a son. Well, wouldn't he like a puppy? The judge inquired. Oh, yes, he'd be tickled pink. All right, I'm going to give him one, the judge announced. He started to tell me how to feed the puppy. Then he paused. You'll forget it, if I tell you. I'll write it out. So the judge went in the house, typed out the pedigree and feeding instructions, and gave me a puppy worth several hundred dollars and one hour and fifteen minutes of his valuable time, largely because I had expressed my honest admiration for his hobby and achievements. George Eastman, of Kodak fame, invented the transparent film that made motion pictures possible, amassed a fortune of a hundred million dollars, and made himself one of the most famous businessmen on earth. Yet in spite of all these tremendous accomplishments, he craved little recognitions even as you and I. To illustrate, when Eastman was building the Eastman School of Music, and also Kilburn Hall in Rochester, James Adamson, then president of the Superior Seating Company of New York, wanted to get the order to supply the theater chairs for these buildings. Phoning the architect, Mr. Adamson made an appointment to see Mr. Eastman in Rochester. When Adamson arrived, the architect said, I know you want to get this order, but I can tell you right now that you won't stand a ghost of a show if you take more than five minutes of George Eastman's time. He is a strict disciplinarian. He is very busy. So tell your story quickly and get out. Adamson was prepared to do just that. When he was ushered into the room he saw Mr. Eastman bending over a pile of papers at his desk. Presently, Mr. Eastman looked up, removed his glasses, and walked toward the architect and Mr. Adamson, saying, good morning, gentlemen, what can I do for you? The architect introduced them, and then Mr. Adamson said, while we've been waiting for you, Mr. Eastman, I've been admiring your office. I wouldn't mind working in a room like this myself. I'm in the interior woodworking business, and I never saw a more beautiful office in all my life. George Eastman replied, you remind me of something I have almost forgotten. It is beautiful, isn't it? I enjoyed it a great deal, when it was first built. But I come down here now with a lot of other things on my mind, and sometimes don't even see the room for weeks at a time. Adamson walked over and rubbed his hand across a panel. This is English oak, isn't it? A little different texture from Italian oak. Yes, Eastman replied. Imported English oak. It was selected for me by a friend who specializes in fine woods. Then Eastman showed him about the room, commenting on the proportions, the coloring, the hand carving, and other effects he had helped to plan and execute. 
While drifting about the room, admiring the woodwork, they pause before a window, and George Eastman, in his modest, soft-spoken way, pointed out some of the institutions through which he was trying to help humanity, the University of Rochester, the General Hospital, the Homeopathic Hospital, the Friendly Home, the Children's Hospital. Mr. Adamson congratulated him warmly on the idealistic way he was using his wealth to alleviate the sufferings of humanity. Presently, George Eastman unlocked a glass case and pulled out the first camera he had ever owned an invention he had bought from an Englishman. Adamson questioned him at length about his early struggles to get started in business, and Mr. Eastman spoke with real feeling about the poverty of his childhood, telling how his widowed mother had kept a boarding house while he clerked in an insurance office. The terror of poverty haunted him day and night, and he resolved to make enough money so that his mother wouldn't have to work, Mr. Adamson drew him out with further questions and listened, absorbed, while he related the story of his experiments with dry photographic plates. He told how he had worked in an office all day and sometimes experimented all night, taking only brief naps, while the chemicals were working, sometimes working and sleeping in his clothes for 72 hours at a stretch. James Adamson had been ushered into Eastman's office at 10.15 and had been warned that he must not take more than five minutes, but an hour had passed, then two hours passed. And they were still talking. Finally, George Eastman turned to Adamson and said, the last time I was in Japan I bought some chairs, brought them home, and put them in my sun porch. But the sun peeled the paint, so I went downtown the other day and bought some paint and painted the chairs myself. Would you like to see what sort of a job I can do painting chairs? All right. Come up to my home and have lunch with me, and I'll show you. After lunch, Mr. Eastman showed Adamson the chairs he had brought from Japan. They weren't worth more than a few dollars, but George Eastman, now a multimillionaire, was proud of them because he himself had painted them. The order for the seats amounted to 90,000. Who do you suppose got the order James Adamson or one of his competitors? From the time of this story until Mr. Eastman's death, he and James Adamson were close friends. Claude Marais, a restaurant owner in Rouen, France, used this principle and saved his restaurant the loss of a key employee. This woman had been in his employ for five years and was a vital link between M. Marais and his staff of 21 people. He was shocked to receive a registered letter from her advising him of her resignation. M. Marais reported, I was very surprised and, even more, disappointed because I was under the impression that I had been fair to her and receptive to her needs. Inasmuch as she was a friend as well as an employee, I probably had taken her too much for granted and maybe was even more demanding of her than of other employees. I could not, of course, accept this resignation without some explanation. I took her aside and said, Paulette, you must understand that I cannot accept your resignation you mean a great deal to me and to this company and you are as important to the success of this restaurant as I am. I repeated this in front of the entire staff and I invited her to my home and reiterated my confidence in her with my family present. Paulette withdrew her resignation and today I can rely on her as never before. I frequently reinforce this by expressing my appreciation for what she does and showing her how important she is to me and to the restaurant. Talk to people about themselves, said Disraeli, one of the shrewdest men who ever ruled the British Empire. Talk to people about themselves and they will listen for hours. Principle 6 Make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. In a nutshell 6 ways to make people like you. Principle 1 Become genuinely interested in other people. Principle 2 Smile. Principle 3 Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. Principle 4 Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Principle 5 Talk in terms of the other person's interests. Principle 6 Make the other person feel important and do it sincerely.